subscribe click on the bell like comment chapter one of oscar wilde and myself alfred douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain oxford after leaving winchester where i won the school steeplechase and edited a paper called the pentagram the only literary or journalistic venture by the way out of which i ever made a profit i went up to oxford in the ordinary course i was entered at magdalen college and i remained an undergraduate of the university for four years magdalen as it always has been in recent times and still continues to be was considered a more or less fashionable college it was the never-ending boast of oscar wilde that he had been there the continuous when i was at oxford which crops up in his writings was complimented by continuous when i was at magdalen in his conversation i do not know that there was anything extraordinary about magdalen in my time i look back upon my life there as fairly pleasant and chiefly so because i had the companionship of my friend the late viscount encombe whose death at the early age of twenty-eight was a great blow to me of course i met at oxford all the people who were supposed to be worth meeting there was mr warren then as now president of magdalen whom i remember on account of his black beard and his very obsequious treatment of myself he was a profound admirer of matthew arnold whose poetry he urged me to study and imitate he also rather incongruously professed great admiration for the writings of his personal friend john addington simmons i say incongruously for an admiration for matthew arnold ought surely to preclude an admiration for simmons at any rate as far as poetry is concerned for oscar wilde he also admitted a great partiality they had been contemporaries at the university in their undergraduate days and to a certain extent friends when wilde came up to see me at oxford he always made a point of calling on mr warren and on these occasions i invariably accompanied him and i thus had the advantage of profiting by their conversation which needless to say generally turned on literary matters but i cannot honestly say that i was greatly edified or that any gems of purest ray serene from these duologues have remained shining in my memory when i first became an intimate friend of oscar wilde my mother who had an instinctive dislike of wilde wrote to mr warren and asked him if he considered wilde was the sort of man who would be a good friend for me the president in reply sent her a long letter in which he gave wilde a very high character praised his great gifts and achievements of scholarship and literature and assured her that i might consider myself lucky to have obtained the favourable notice of such an eminent man i mention this not as anything to mr warren's detriment but simply to show the sort of reputation wilde at that time enjoyed among the bigwigs of the university then there was walter pater to whom i was introduced by wilde on the first occasion when the latter visited me at oxford wilde had an immense opinion of pater and spoke of him always with reverence as the greatest living writer of prose i tried hard to appreciate pater and he personally was kind to me but quite apart from the fact that he had practically no conversation and would sit for hours without saying more than an occasional word i never could bring myself to have more than a very limited admiration for his far-famed prose which has always seemed to me artificial finicking and over-elaborated to an exasperating degree i have altogether livelier recollections of mr now the reverend doctor bustle pater's most intimate friend at brasenose for he was a fine musician and had a devotion to handel and back which endears his memory to me to this day 
next to Encombe, probably my best friend among the undergraduates of my day, was the poet Lionel Johnson, a frail, tiny man with probably the finest head and the kindest heart in the university. We talked and wrote a considerable amount of poetry together, and it was Johnson who introduced me to Oscar Wilde. At this period, Wilde had just begun to be considered a person of some promise in letters. He had outgrown aesthetics, and had written The Picture of Dorian Gray and Intentions, and was rehearsing his first play, Lady Windermere's Fan. One vacation I went with Johnson to Wilde's house in Tite Street, and over dinner commenced a friendship which was to be none too fortunate for either of us. For some reason or other, Wilde insisted on being considerably more brilliant that evening than ever he was afterwards. Indeed, he fired off witticisms so persistently, and with such an evident anxiety not to miss even the slenderest of opportunities, that, while I had come to the meeting in the spirit of the youthful admirer, or literary hero-worshipper, I went away with a sort of feeling that I had been at a show, and that I had not seen a really great man after all. However, as our acquaintance ripened, I began to understand, or imagine that I understood, Wilde's moods. I soon perceived that he said quite half of everything he had to say with his tongue in his cheek, and that one should not really take him seriously, because his only aim in conversation was not to say what he believed, but to say what he supposed to be witty, profound, whimsical, or brilliant at the moment. Further, I soon discovered that Wilde was one of those conversationalists who were conscious of the value, not only of their own mo, but of those of other people, and that his or my joke or epigram let loose over lunch on Monday was bound to figure in the bit of dialogue or portion of an essay which he would indite, with the help of stiff whiskies and sodas and illimitable cigarettes, on a Tuesday morning. At the same time, I cheerfully admit that I found him an agreeable, entertaining, and even lovable acquaintance. He had, of course, an eye for humour and beauty. He was a great deal of a scholar. He spoke good English and excellent French, and he had a pleasant voice and a charming delivery. Compared with the average man about town, he shone, and, compared with the average man of genius, he scintillated. During my second year at Oxford, I contributed to the University Magazine, the official journal of the University, a poem which pleased everybody but its author, and provoked the excellent Mr. Warren to write me a lengthy letter of praise and congratulation. Unfortunately, I have not got this epistle at hand, otherwise I might be tempted to print it with a view of convincing the University Oxford that I am indeed somewhat of a poet. This was the first serious poem I ever wrote, or at any rate preserved, and it is now included in The City of the Soul. I also contributed on several occasions to an undergraduate paper called The Spirit Lamp, which was owned by a man whose name I forget, but he called on me one day and explained that he was going down and very munificently offered to make me a present of his journalistic property if, as he diffidently put it, I cared to take it on and would promise to continue its high traditions to the best of my ability. I gave this gentleman the necessary assurances and the spirit lamp became mine. Six or seven subsequent numbers appeared under my editorship, and copies of these numbers are, I understand, worth considerably more than their published price in what is known as the market. Of my own contributions, I have a poor opinion, though they were warmly appreciated at the time of their appearance by that class of person who makes warm appreciations a sort of hobby. I am proud of the fact, however, that I printed some of Lionel Johnson's best verses, 
and several contributions from the late john addington simmons and i also had the advantage of various contributions from wilde including his prose poems the disciple and the house of judgment and what i consider to be the best sonnet he ever wrote wilde frequently came to oxford in those days and on several occasions stayed as my guest in the rooms in high street which i shared with my friend lord encombe although throughout my career as an undergraduate i was keenly interested in poetry and letters generally i did not profess to belong to any literary set and i had no notion of taking to writing as a profession my name and family traditions marked me out for the sporting and convivial side of university life rather than for serious literary endeavour i read for the honours school in a desultory kind of way but relieved the tedium of my prescribed studies by a good deal of riding and boating and fairly regular attendance at such race meetings as were within reasonable distance of what mr ruskin doubtless called his alma mater at the same time my interest in poetry was well known in the university and i was considered a poet of promise and parts of course every undergraduate who can write poetry at all is expected to compete for the newdigate prize i was frequently urged by my friends to enter for this prize but none of the subjects set during my first three years at oxford appealed to me tennyson if i remember rightly won the newdigate with a poem about timbuktu such a subject while perhaps entertaining enough in its way is obviously not very inspiring and certainly not calculated to induce the production of high poetry as i have said the subjects set in my first three years did not excite in me any great poetical emotion in my fourth year however the subject was saint francis of assisi and i felt at once that here was my opportunity i told my friends that i should enter and began to plan the poem i was talking of the matter at dinner one night with encombe and the late lord warkworth afterwards earl percy who was at that time at christchurch and i told the latter that i was going in for the prize he said that he too was having a shot at it and pointed out that it was impossible for me to enter as i was in my fourth year he offered to show me the rule in the statutes but unfortunately we had not a copy handy and i took it that warkworth knew what he was talking about and let the thing drop lord warkworth won the newdigate that year himself and it was only after the announcement of his success that i discovered that there was no such rule as the one he had told me of of course i make no aspersion on warkworth's good intentions in the matter yet in a sense it is a pity that i did not look more closely into the rules because though i say it myself i could have beaten him with a good many lengths to spare and though to have won the newdigate means perhaps very little from a literary point of view it appears to be a good backing for a man who goes in seriously for poetry i have noticed with some astonishment that whenever opportunity has arisen persons who do not love me have been at pains to suggest that there was something discreditable about my oxford career it has been hinted that i was sent down in disgrace and great capital has been made of the circumstance that i left oxford without a degree in point of fact i was sent down in my second year for a term because i was ploughed in my examination for smalls and i soon set this right by spending three weeks with a crammer and getting myself well posted up in euclid and such like subjects which though doubtless very important in their way had never specially attracted me when the time came for my examination in the honours school i happened to be ill and was unable to attend 
so that I left the university degreeless. Without any suggestion from me, the authorities offered to confer an honorary degree upon me if I cared to return in the vacation and pass two papers. I consulted my father, the late Marquis of Queensbury, on the subject, and he told me that he had never known a degree to be worth tuppence to anybody, and, accordingly, I never took the trouble to avail myself of the Oxford's kind offer. If going down without a degree is a crime, I belong to an excellent company of criminals, for Swinburne left Oxford minus a degree, and so did Lord Rosebery, and, if it comes to genius, so did the poet Shelley. I need hardly say that Oscar Wilde expressed himself as entirely delighted with my remissness in failing to become an M.A. Oxen. He said, in his usual airy way, that it was wonderful of me, and a distinction. And he pointed out that I should be like Swinburne, who determined to remain an undergraduate all his life. I am free to confess that, personally, I did not take much interest in the matter either way, though, had I understood the world then as I understand it now, I might have been a trifle less careless. Generally, I do not wish it to be supposed that my life at Oxford was any more immaculate than that of other young men in my own position in life. I came into collision with the authorities on various small sins of omission and commission. I was gated once for going to the Derby, wicked youth that I was, and I dare say I worried the authorities by my persistent refusal to take either themselves or the university for the most serious thing in nature. But I lived with them gloriously and delicately for the full undergraduate span of four years, save one term over Smalls, and, as I have shown, they were quite willing to take me to their bosom as a full member of the university if I had cared to fall into their embrace. The idea that Oxford is a place entirely given over to the laborious and the assiduous pursuit of knowledge is a mistake, it can be proved quite easily that, while the assiduous and the laborious who choose to make Oxford a sort of career may do very well out of it in the way of fellowships, scholastic appointments, and so forth, the best men Oxford turns out are, in the main, men who have been considered to have missed their opportunities. Everybody who was anybody at Oxford in my time had a disposition to be very modest about learning, and a trifle shy about recommending it as the be-all and end-all of life. There is a tale attributed to a certain worthy Don, indeed it is said to have been his stock story, which relates to two excellent youths of good family who went up to Oxford together. One of them was slack and fond of his ease, he read nothing and did nothing, and, after years of dissipation, was fain to get a living by driving a handsome cab. The other youth, the pride of his family and college, read everything and won everything, and did everything that was proper. Years after, somebody found him in London doing his best to keep the wolf from the door by driving a four-wheeler. This is an old story, but it is a very good one, and anybody who knows Oxford in the intimate personal sense knows how true it may well be. For myself, I think if it had come to cab driving, the hansom would unquestionably have been my vehicle. I was careless and desultory in the widest sense of the terms, so careless and desultory, in fact, that with a view to saving time and trouble in my intercourse with the authorities, I had a form printed as follows. Lord Alfred Bruce Douglas presents his compliments to blank, and regrets that he will be unable to blank, in consequence of blank. Filled up, this ingenious document would read as follows. <laughs> 
Lord Alfred Bruce Douglas presents his compliments to Professor Smith and regrets that he will be unable to show up an essay on the evolution of the moral idea in consequence of not having prepared one. I found these missives extremely useful and used a great quantity. They were famed throughout the university and, though they angered some of the dons to the verge of madness, nothing could be done about them because they were obviously polite and an undergraduate who is polite to his pastors and masters has done his duty. It may be on the strength of this form and on my being sent down for a failure to pass smalls that the legend and fiction of my alleged ignominious career at oxford depends i know of nothing more serious otherwise i should be pleased to unburden myself both before and after i terminated my undergraduate ship by removing my name from the books of magdalen college i was a frequent visitor to the scene of my old triumphs and kept up many friendships among the men of my time and among the university authorities i removed my name from the books of my own free will and as a matter of personal convenience what i did may have been a trifle unusual though i am acquainted with at least one distinguished oxford man who did precisely the same thing and that my actions should have been twisted into a sort of horrible wickedness must have startled a good many other people besides myself so much for the gay lord alfred douglas undergraduate of magdalen college oxford end of chapter one chapter two of oscar wilde and myself by lord alfred douglas this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lost Illusions It is very hard, indeed well-nigh impossible, for me to recapture and set forth for the benefit of my readers the secret of the fascination that Oscar Wilde had for me in those far-off days. The revelation of his perfidy and vileness, which came to me when, about a year ago, I first got knowledge of the existence of the unpublished portion of De Profundis, the shock of horror, indignation and disgust which the reading of that abominable document produced in my mind, and the ever-recurring reflection that, during the last few years of his life, and after his release from prison, when he was professing the greatest friendship and affection for me, and living, for a time in part, and ultimately altogether, on my bounty, he was all the while the secret author of a foul and lying attack on me and on my family, which he had arranged to make public after my death, combined to make the task of reconstructing a semblance of my old feeling for him almost a hopeless one. Long, however, before I had cognizance of the unpublished de profundis my view of his character and my estimate of his value as a man of letters had undergone a profound change with the passing of the years and a more serious and mature outlook on the facts of life and on the responsibilities of those who seek the suffrages or merely the ears of the general reader i had arrived at the conclusion that oscar wilde's writings were ridiculously overrated that he was never either a great poet or a great writer of prose, and that the harm he had caused to the whole body of English literature, and the pernicious effect he had exercised on the literary movements and the journalism of the period immediately succeeding his own, very much more than counterbalanced the credit of any legitimate success he may have achieved, still up till the period when the discovery of the unpublished part of de profundis was forced upon my notice i carefully refrained from giving voice to these sentiments the man had been my friend i had been very fond of him and i had formerly had an exaggerated view as to the value of his work I did not therefore consider that I was in any way called upon to interfere with his literary reputation, 
even though in my opinion it was a specious reputation and the result moreover of a cleverly engineered campaign on his behalf made by friends who were more careful of wilde's fame than of the general good of letters still less did i conceive it to be any part of my duty to attack what was left of his character on the contrary i steadily persisted in taking the best view possible of the man and until i read the unpublished de profundis i kept a great measure of my affection for his memory and in common with many other people cherished fond illusions about his moral character that my affection for him was real and sincere and continued to be so right up to the time when i read the unpublished part of de profundis is fairly proved by the facts that i persistently defended him even at the cost of some violence to my own literary conscience in the columns of the academy when i was its editor and that i wrote to his memory one of my best sonnets which i here reproduce the dead poet i dreamed of him last night i saw his face all radiant and unshadowed of distress and as of old in music measureless i heard his golden voice and marked him trace under the common thing the hidden grace and conjure wonder out of emptiness till mean things put on beauty like a dress and all the world was an enchanted place and then methought outside a fast locked gate i mourned the loss of unrecorded words forgotten tales and mysteries half said wonders that might have been articulate and voiceless thoughts like murdered singing birds and so i woke and knew that he was dead now i wrote that sonnet as long ago as nineteen o one within a few months of wilde's death but i included it in my nineteen o nine volume of sonnets and in face of it i could not possibly pretend even if i wished to do so that i was not at one time deeply attached to him and that i continued to cherish his memory after his death but when it comes to explaining that attachment and reproducing the atmosphere which generated it i find that i am met at the outset by this deplorable setback namely and to wit that the very qualities in him which then excited my admiration now evoke my contempt it must be remembered that when i met wilde i was very young in years and still younger in temperament and in experience i was in fact a mere child i reproduce on the opposite page a photograph of myself taken in my second year at oxford just about the time i first met wilde it is obviously the photograph of a boy and a fairly unsophisticated boy at that there are numbers of my friends and contemporaries at oxford now living and they could all bear witness to the fact that even at the age of twenty-three i had the appearance of a youth of sixteen and though of course i should have been woefully offended if any one had told me so at the time there was much in my character that corresponded with my appearance i don't think there was ever any one so easily deceived such an obvious mark for the designing as i was in those days i was never allowed to forget that i was lord alfred douglas the son of a marquis and a person of consequence the mere fact that i thought myself very knowing and a complete man of the world only served to make me an easier victim to any accomplished teller of the literary tale wilde made a dead set at me he was attracted by my youth my guilelessness and to be perfectly frank by what he considered my social importance and he laid himself out to captivate me and to fascinate me he was then about forty years of age he was a brilliant talker everyone admits that i have never heard it denied even by his greatest enemy he was utterly unlike anyone or anything that i had ever come across before 
and he had that sort of assumption of certainty about all the problems of life which is one of the compensations exchanged for many other better things that comes at that age to an accomplished man of the world he had a habit of enunciating the most entirely unmoral and subversive sentiments in a manner and with an air of final authority which could not fail to appeal to a high-spirited youth already inclined as is the manner of high-spirited youth to kick over the traces according to him it didn't matter in the least what one did as long as one happened to be a charming and graceful young man related to everyone in the peerage and did whatever one wanted to do in a charming and graceful manner this simple and beautiful theory appealed irresistibly to me as it very well might to any thoughtless youth and coming as it did from one who was actually looked up to and admired by the president of my college and who had been commended to my mother as a most desirable acquaintance for me it naturally seemed the last word of wisdom but how can i be expected now to have anything but contempt for such arts practised by a clever man of the world on an unreflecting boy or how can i be blamed because the recollection of the fact that i was for the time attracted by such preposterous and poisonous speciousness is anything else but repugnant to me now when i look back on it in my desperate anxiety to do justice to the memory of one who was formerly my friend i might be tempted to give more instances of his method of dealing with young men whose good will he was anxious to obtain but by so doing i should add nothing to his reputation even for cleverness it is the easiest thing in the world to turn the head of a young fellow at oxford or cambridge any man of the world could do so if he cared to take the trouble and was sufficiently unscrupulous it does not require great wit or great brains or anything but impudence and a blunted sense of humour these two qualities wilde undoubtedly possessed it is easy for any one who has not forgotten the time of his own youth to see how wilde contrived to attract me he flattered me incessantly he professed extreme admiration for the few poetical efforts which i had then produced efforts by the way which in his reading jail days became poor undergraduate verses and whatever i did or whatever i said was wonderful in his eyes he displayed all the outward signs and symbols of friendship and affection he has himself set them all out faithfully so that i am spared the necessity of reproducing them here i will merely put it on record to give him the whole of the credit that can possibly be due to him that in the matter of sending expensive bunches of muscat grapes and copies of the illustrated papers to my bedside when i happened to be ill promptly replying to requests for an immediate dispatch of cigarettes when i had gone away to the country and forgotten to take them with me and remembering my favourite dishes when i happened to dine with him he was all that a loving heart could wish i accepted these husks for the real bread of friendship and because it has been all through my life my fatal habit to idealise my friends and to endow them with all sorts of qualities which they never dreamed of possessing i conceived a great and lasting affection for this man and when he was in trouble i fought for him and defended him through thick and thin and without any regard to rhyme or reason or my own interest hence these tears and i am not in the least disposed to dispute that i have only myself to blame and that it served me very well right but this is got by casting pearl to hogs End of chapter two Chapter Three of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Wild in Society In view of the curious anxiety of those who support and uphold the wild legend, to paint him for us as a man of fashion and social position, it may be interesting if I try to recall Oscar Wilde in his figure as a buck, or, as we nowadays say, man about town. There can be no doubt whatever that he did really consider himself a person of fashion and social standing, outside of his claims to literary notoriety. In his writings he is very fond of using such phrases as men of our rank, people of our social class, and so forth. Rank is a good word, and Wilde knew perfectly well how to use it in a manner which would lead people really to believe that he was nobly born. He was able to talk of his mother as Lady Wilde, and I have heard him refer to her in certain company as Her Ladyship, with great effect. You would imagine from his manner that she was a grand dame of the first water, with two or three large places to her name, and retinues of servants. Of Papa Wilde, we did not hear quite so frequently, probably for the reason that he was not his lordship. At the same time, Wilde could not have put on greater airs than he was sometimes wont to don if his father had been a duke. Now, with this feeling of family about him, it is not extraordinary that he should have tried to live it up to the best of his lights. He opined that if a gentleman of rank is to be taken for a gentleman of rank, he must not only keep his rank duly prominent in his conversation, but he must also look, dress, and, as far as possible, live the part. In the matter of looks, Wilde believed in his heart that he had the bulge of all the literary people of his time. Tennyson might wear prophetic robes and wide-awake hats. Swinburne might look the decent little ginger gentleman he was. Pater might pass for the profound and beetle-browed thinker on the high arts. Bernard Shaw might pass for the bewhiskered fire-eater. Arthur Simmons for the blonde angel, Beardsley for the delicate spider-legged artist. But when it came to nobility and beauty of features, Wilde was convinced that he had them all beaten to a frazzle. He was very fond of likening himself to the Roman emperors. He had a big face, which was, as he himself put it, delicately chiselled. And if anybody had asked him to sit for a bust of Nero, he would have considered that person most discerning. I remember him saying to me that, while it was considered among the dull English to be almost criminal for a man to speak of good looks, either in himself or in another man, good looks were half the battle in society. Of course, I laughed and told him not to be a fool, but he meant it all the same, and nothing would make him angrier than the hint that his mouth was too large or that his face was spoiled by too great an expanse of jowl. He took great care of his complexion, and I never knew a man who brushed his hair more frequently in the day than he did. He had a defect which was the sorrow of his life, the arts of the dentist not being so well understood then as they are today. But on this I do not propose to dwell. I have been astonished that the published part of De Profundis contains no touching and beautiful passages relating to clothes, and this is all the more surprising because, in point of fact, Wilde was, to a large extent, a tailor's man. I sometimes think that if he had lived in the present era of Homburg hats and tweed suits, he would never have been famous at all, he began his notoriety by fantastic dressing, but as he ascended on the rungs of art to the heaven of rank, his great aim was for what he termed elegant correctness. Hence, the wild of my time consisted, to a great extent, of silk hat, frock coat, striped trousers and patent leather boots. 
add to these a very tall clouded cane with a heavy gold knob and a pair of grey suede gloves and you have the outward man on the whole i believe that he loathed the get-up especially in the hot weather but he stuck to it like a trojan and nobody ever saw oscar wilde in london outside of the regulation harness from eleven o'clock till seven or outside of the hard white shirt and swallow tails from seven thirty till any time you like in the morning being a roman he must do as persons of rank did in rome and he always struck me as being garbed in perpetual readiness to walk out or dine out with the duke or prince of the blood who would one day surely be calling round for him he had a large turquoise set in diamonds which i had purchased for him in an expansive moment when we happened to be together in a jeweller's shop the occasion was his birthday and i took him to choose his own present his eye fell on this sea-blue bauble in its ring of brilliance and all question of trouble to the shopman was sunk he wore this ornament in his shirt front of evenings with a truly regal dignity for myself i used to call it the blue light or the hope not the hope diamond being at that time very much to the fore in polite conversation in the country he naturally subsided into easier habiliments but even here he must follow the fashion or be a little bit ahead of it his suits and caps must be all of one piece his boots as worn by the nobility and gentry and his general accoutrements designed subtly to convey the impression that he owned at least ten thousand acres somewhere or other this bucolic perfection was entirely a social affair with him for he was most coy of being photographed otherwise than en grand tenue for all his official photographs the frock coat braided for preference or the fur coat with a suggestion of a silk hat on a side table bear the gris the very suggestion of literalism in the matter of appearance horrified him he desired to pass for a gentleman a gentleman of rank and nothing more and this he undoubtedly succeeded in doing to his own satisfaction in his intercourse with the highest in the land which was to put it plainly of a very occasional nature he always seemed to me to be a trifle strained and uneasy he longed to smack certain personages on the back but he never dared to do it with women he succeeded a great deal better than with men somehow the men made him either very stiff or very limp his bow was wasted upon them and his diffident attempts at epigram missed fire i think that women loved him because he would insist that everything was charming or exquisite and because although he was expected to talk brilliantly he really did a great deal of listening late in the proceedings when the buffet had done its harmless necessary work he would open fire and talk amazingly and fifteen to twenty women would hang on his words doubtless because their hostess had told them that mr wilde was so amusing but the men hung aloof when he came away wilde was always as eager to know how he had gone down as a debutante is eager to be informed as to the figure she cut at her first ball if one said you are great oscar he would glow with honest pride if one hummed a little he would be in the depths for a week there were women who didn't admire him in the least and some of them were at no pains to disguise the fact long before the tongue of scandal took definite hold of his name there were whispers that there was something wrong about him and when lady blank referred to him in his hearing as that fellow he became white with passion and was with difficulty restrained from making a demonstration on the whole however 
his social evenings were a source of joy and delight to him and he would talk of this or that party for months after it had taken place with continual notes of gratification in his voice and when as sometimes happened he went to the houses of persons who were not friends of mine i could make sure of brilliantly jewelled accounts of the hijinks and proceedings and of the honour which had been rendered to him by brave and fair alike dear lady so-and-so he would say ah a charming woman if you like came down the staircase to receive me for all the world like enon coming down ida and the prime minister was there and i don't mind telling you that he glowered at me they hate genius my boy and poor old lord blank i have never seen him before looked to me like a waiter extraordinary that a man of his position should look so rusty however i need not tell you that he was very civil to me and when i asked him what he meant by rusty he said well he wore such extraordinary clothes the real facts of the case doubtless were that his hostess was not beautiful at all that the prime minister had not happened to look his way and that despite his rusty suit old lord blank had gone out of his way to meet rather profuse deference with graciousness i don't say that wilde had no social success but what he had was of that curious kind which is here to-day and forgotten to-morrow and his reports of it were always slightly exaggerated it was on such a slender basis that he built up the fabric of wonder and splendour with regard to rank which he afterwards spread out for us in reading jail throughout he draws a great line between the poor thieves and outcasts with whom i now associate and people of our rank never people of our intellect never people of our culture he tells us that in prison he became a great individualist and apparently it was in prison that he became a great aristocrat in one passage in the published de profundis he actually uses the words i had inherited a noble name one need not grudge him these tender allusions and in a way there is something rather pathetic about them but their encouragement was so entirely characteristic of the man that it is impossible to avoid a reference to them in a truthful portrait that wilde did not happen to be nobly born is certainly nothing to his discredit that he should have persistently pretended to noble birth is on the other hand fairly contemptible especially as in his efforts to live up to the part he had allotted to himself he invariably succeeded in behaving in an eminently unaristocratic manner he lacked a kind heart just as surely as he lacked a coronet and norman blood was as alien to him as simple faith End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lord of Language I am not sure that this chapter is headed in quite the way that Oscar Wilde's adherents would like it to be. When he wished to seem particularly important, Wilde was wont to describe himself not only as a lord of language, but as the king of life. His claims to these magniloquent titles have been suffered to pass unquestioned by his critics, and unassailed even by his enemies. The coterie of long-haired persons who weep at the mention of dear Oscar's name, and hold him up for a saint and a martyr, naturally take pride in his own description of himself, and will no doubt consider it remiss of me to leave out one of them from this chapter heading. The king of life business has always appeared to me to have been settled at the old bailey. 
and since such a title as the lord of language is plainly literary in its bearings i suppose i am free to discuss it from the literary point of view and i must state at the outset that i am not concerned to deal with wilde in other than a reasonable critical spirit if his fame and writings had been left to themselves instead of becoming the subject of attentions on the part of overzealous log rollers on the one hand and catchpenny scandal mongers on the other wilde would in the nature of things have attained to his proper position in literary history and to his proper status as an author as it is i maintain that the current views about his character and his writings are exaggerated and even preposterous views very far ahead of the true facts and in a large measure opposed to what wilde himself would have wished practically everybody nowadays who writes for pleasure or for profit about oscar fingal o'flaherty wills wilde has taken him for granted as a sort of literary and artistic aristocrat who had a natural right to the best of life and for whom all beauty and delicacy were created one of the most recent of his biographers says wilde provides us with the rare spectacle of a man most of whose powers are those of a spectator a connoisseur a man for whom pictures are painted and books written the perfect elaborator for whom the artist hopes in his heart i have never seen a fault of taste a fault of judgment or a fault of intellect attributed to him even his vices are held up to us as having been necessary to the development of his chartered and immaculate soul and as having contributed and been necessary to the perfection of his work greater buncombe was never propagated wilde was far from being in any sense a perfervid worshipper of the beautiful to suggest that beauty was all in all for him is to suggest what is not true he was never content that other people should write fine poetry or fine prose for him to admire his sole ambition being to write fine things himself not especially for the fine things sake but for the sake of being able to pose as the one great and superior person in all the world it is not to wilde's discredit perhaps that he praised but little or as one might say frugally there was nobody of his time who greatly required to be praised he professed the stock admiration for tennyson swinburne meredith and pater but when he expressed it which was seldom it was always with the reservation that of the five he himself was the greatest there were occasions of course when he could be adulatory and even obsequious but this was either to dead men or to those of his contemporaries who were engaged in arts with which he was not concerned as a practitioner his sonnets to miss ellen terry and the late henry irving may stand for his monument in this special line as to artists painting pictures for him and so forth the great quarrel of his life was with whistler from whom he derived practically everything that he affected to know about art and whose work he believed to be vastly overrated of pictures in their relation to beauty he had little or no appreciation just as the far-famed blue china at oxford was valuable to him because he could make mows over it and get himself talked about so all his views and his expressions of opinion with respect to art were not the views and opinions of the person who loves and knows art but were designed to illustrate his own singularity or superiority or to support a pose in spite of all he wrote and said on the subject and in spite of all that has been said and written by his admirers there is nothing of wilde that persists in criticism on the art side which is not to be found in whistler's ten o'clock or which he had not gleaned either from his contemporaries or from the older writers on the literary side in order to show more clearly what i mean let us take the preface to dorian gray which as is well known consists of a number of aphorisms concerning art and criticism 
as Wilde is supposed to have believed in them. I quote some of them. The artist is the creator of beautiful things. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim. The critic is he who can translate into another manner or a new material his impression of beautiful things. The highest, as the lowest, form of criticism is a mode of autobiography. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings in beautiful things are the cultivated. For these there is hope. They are the elect, to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. The nineteenth century dislike of realism is the rage of Caliban seeing his own face in a glass. The nineteenth century dislike of romanticism is the rage of Caliban not seeing his own face in a glass. The moral life of man forms part of the subject matter of the artist, but the morality of art consists in the perfect use of an imperfect medium. No artist desires to prove anything. Even things that are true can be proved. Thought and language are to the artist instruments of an art. Vice and virtue are to the artist materials for an art. From the point of view of form, the type of all the arts is the art of the musician. From the point of view of feeling, the actor's craft is the type. It is the spectator, and not life, that art really mirrors. Diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work is new, complex, and vital. When critics disagree, the artist is in accord with himself. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing, as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. These remarks have been held up to us as Wilde's credo, and, slight and few though they be, it is the fact that they do really epitomise what some people call his teaching. One has only to glance at them, however, to perceive that, without exception, they are either obvious or perverted truisms, or the merest glosses on quite hoary critical adages. For example, the artist is the creator of beautiful things, must have been said at least a thousand times before Wilde suddenly rushed upon the world with it as a new and marvellous discovery. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim, is a very cheap variant of the saying that language was invented to conceal one's thoughts, or Horace's old tag, Ars est calare artem. The highest and lowest form of criticism is a form of autobiography. It's merely to say what was said by Rousseau, namely, that all writing is in essence autobiographical, while it is the spectator and not life that art really mirrors, is merely Shakespeare's beauty is in the eye of the beholder clumsily rendered. All the talk about there being no such thing as a moral or an immoral book, and about art being quite useless, is the merest perversion and fiddle-dee-dee, as anybody who is not in the last stage of idiocy will perceive for himself. I maintain that this statement of Wilde, which, by the way, did not originally appear as a preface to Dorian Gray, but was painfully and carefully compiled when its author was at the height of his achievement and wished to pontificate, shows us clearly the nature of the man's mind. 
which was a shallow and comparatively feeble mind, incapable of grappling unaided with even moderately profound things, and disposed to frivol and antic with old thoughts for lack of power to evolve new ones. It was a mind which was continually discovering with a glow that two and two make four, or pretending to discover with a much warmer glow that two and two make five. In every scrap that he wrote, leaving out, of course, the poems, you will find this feeble, mediocre, but withal vainglorious instrument hard at work on the fearful business of saying nothing in such a way that foolish people will shout about it. Wilde knew himself for a shallow and oblique thinker. The fact that he never did anything really great has been set down to his indolence. It was due really to shallowness rather than indolence. When he found that nobody would read his poetry, he became most indolent about the writing of verses, and complained that there was nothing for a poet of his eminence to write about. When he found that people would listen to lectures written on a basis of Whistler and William Morris, he wrote and delivered such lectures with an industry worthy of the best of causes. And when he found actor-managers who would produce on account for such drama as Lady Windermere's fan and such comedy as the importance of being earnest, he wrote plays till the sweat fairly rolled off him. But he was conscious, as every unbiased contemporary critic was conscious, that he ran very far short of the achievement of which he was wont to plume himself, and he knew that when it came to serious things he was always considered more or less a dabbler. Like most Irishmen, he was troubled all his life with attacks of regret, which he was accustomed to call remorse. He believed that he had supreme gifts, and that he had squandered them. He never could see that it was impossible that a man who pretended, as he pretended, could ever have had supreme gifts. His remorse over the squandering of these alleged gifts was at times ludicrous to behold. He would bemoan his wasted life, and come very nigh shedding tears about his shallowness at two o'clock in the morning, while at one o'clock the same day he would be swallowing ortolans as if they were oysters, and swearing over some silly liqueur that he was the greatest genius that ever lived. In time this notion of shallowness became an obsession with him. He makes constant use of the word shallow in his writings, and right through De Profundis you find him crying, The supreme vice is shallowness, in and out of season, and without the remotest reference to the context. Of course, if we endeavour to look into the psychology of the situation, we perceive clearly that it was impossible for a man of Wilde's type to do any really big work, and he certainly never did do it. His claims to be considered as a lord of language will not bear looking into. He wrote passable verse, and competent prose, but he wrote no better verse and no better prose than several other men of his time whose writings are more or less forgotten. We have it on the statement of Mr. Justice Darling that Wilde could conjure with words, I should like chapter and verse for any verbal conjuring which can be considered worth remembering, or which, for that matter, is remembered. I think that all Wilde did for the English language was to degrade, abuse, or make ridiculous such words as exquisite, wonderful, charming, delightful, delicate, and so forth. He bored me to death at times with his how perfectly wonderful of you, with his charming fellows, and charming ladies, delicious dishes, exquisite liqueurs, and general ecstatics, were like sands on the sea where the blue wave rolls nightly. He was plagued with the Irishman's propensity to muddle his shells and wills, and I found in him an utter incapacity to understand or appreciate, in the literary sense, 
certain plain english idioms with which any man possessed of a feeling for language would never have had the slightest trouble i remember having a lengthy and fearful argument with him over shakespeare's use of the word your in such phrases as your tanner will last you eleven years he could understand neither the force nor the sense of such usages and though he tumbled in the end he was a fearful time about it one does not expect such dullness in a lord of language end of chapter four chapter five of oscar wilde and myself by lord alfred douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain our mutual friends according to the ransom book the biographical details of which its author admits have been checked by mr robert ross oscar wilde was the son of william wilde knighted in eighteen sixty four a celebrated oculist and aurist a man of great intellectuality and uncertain temper a runner after girls with a lusty enjoyment of life and a delight in falling stars and thunderstorms this is an ingenious way of presenting a decidedly dubious and unpleasing character to an awe-stricken world wilde's father was certainly a knight but heaven alone knows who his grandfather was it is also to be noted that while sir william wilde may have died a celebrated oculist and aurist he began life as an apothecary and for years kept a chemist's shop in an obscure part of dublin the runner after girls admission on the part of messrs ransom and ross is also very touching seeing that william wilde had once been prosecuted for insulting a lady patient and that everybody knows the story of wilde's father and the witty veterinary surgeon who rallied him on the subject with one of the sharpest bits of sarcasm that ever fell from a man's mouth it is perhaps necessary for me to say here that i have never in my life laid any great stress upon the advantages of birth if a man's manners and disposition are all right i am not greatly concerned to know that his father drove pigs or got locked up for stealing spoons at the same time i have never been able to repress feelings of amused contempt for that numerous body of persons who having no ancestry or forebears to speak of make a point of proclaiming themselves to be persons of family and invent all manner of legends to support their supposed exalted birth in the case of wilde it is due to him to say that he kept his parentage and extraction fairly in the background so far as i was concerned he admitted that he belonged to the irish middle classes and prided himself on having risen to academic honour not with the help of money but by sheer force of intellect this was in the early days of our acquaintance ultimately when he had managed to get out of the rut of bohemianism and to find his way into respectable society he began to conceive himself in the light of a very great social figure and it was easy for him to suppose that he was a born member of the aristocracy and that all his people belonged to what burke i believe calls the titled landed and official classes i used to smile at these pretensions and joke with him about them and he would admit that he was foolish but the fact remains that to the end of his life he kept up the legend of his high birth and connections and was eager always to pass himself off as a great gentleman his biographers have taken up the wondrous tale and without saying so in as many words they lead the polite world of wild worshippers to believe that their saint was what the young lady called a gentleman in his own right the wilds were people of consideration in dublin says the zealous mr ransom his schoolfellows did not have to ask wilde who his father was well possibly they didn't for very different reasons than those mr ransom would have us conjure up 
down to the time of my first meeting wilde he had never had any real footing in society and though he fought for it desperately during the period of our friendship i doubt if he ever really got it he was too obviously the tuft hunter and the snob ever to be liked by the people for whose acquaintance he sighed i never could see why a man of his talents and mode of life should have been so desperately anxious to be hail fellow well met with some of the dullest and silliest people in the world but there can be no doubt that he dearly loved a lord and would put up with a great deal of pain and inconvenience on the mere chance of a casual word or two with a duchess when our acquaintance began he knew nobody and though his name was in the papers and his picture turned up from time to time in punch you never saw him at the places where he would have given his soul to be he told me that at magdalen he had managed to get on terms with an unmarried duke but before this beam of sunshine had shone upon him for a year or two the duke incontinently married and the duchess intervened and put an end to the intimacy wilde's own set of friends and acquaintances struck one as being a peculiar assemblage but he assured me that they were great and charming people and that they were all on the high road to eminence and fame and being young and unversed in the world's ways i took him at his word and set down my incapacity to appreciate his immediate entourage to my own dullness and lack of perspicacity the first stars in the firmament of charming fellows and world-compelling geniuses brought to me by wilde were mr robert ross and mr reggie turner according to the allegations brought against me at the ransom trial when wilde entertained these gentlemen at dinner he did it in soho and with the help of a shilling bottle of madoc whereas when i lord alfred douglas was his guest it was always at willis's rooms and to the accompaniment of specially imported pates from strasbourg and priceless champagnes in point of fact all four of us drank a good many humble whiskies and sodas at the cafe royal and dined and lunched at the same place without any great effusions of money on anybody's part wilde was a doughty and assiduous trencherman i would have backed him to eat the head off a brewer's drayman three times a day and his capacity for whisky and soda knew no bounds the marvel of it was that he never became really drunk though from four o'clock in the afternoon till three in the morning he was never really sober the more he drank the more he talked and without whisky he could neither talk nor write after messrs ross and turner wilde brought along the late ernest dowson who for some reason or other seemed scared out of his wits mr max beerbohm who giggled prettily at everything either wilde or i said and mr frank harris who wore the same costly furs and roared in the same sucking dove way as still continues to delight his troops of friends they were a merry and i am afraid a rather careless company they talked art poetry and politics none of them seemed to have much to do though i believe all of them were fairly busy men and on the whole they were pleasant enough people to meet gradually however the acquaintance between myself and wilde began to strengthen and become more intimate i took him to my mother's place near ascot and introduced him to a good many people whom he considered to be important he met my cousin george wyndham who i believe asked him down afterwards to clouds and at his very special request i introduced him to my brother viscount drumlanrig at that time a lord in waiting to queen victoria no two men could have less in common than drumlanrig and wilde on one hand you had a soldier and a sportsman with perhaps a bit of the courtier thrown in 
on the other hand you had the overdressed bohemian with his hair nicely parted and very anxious to be friendly and charming my brother was amused and though they did not meet more than three times it was years before wilde ceased to talk pompously of my friend lord drumlanrig lord-in-waiting to her majesty i also introduced him to my grandfather mr alfred montgomery who took a violent and invincible dislike to him and declined to meet him again in addition to the people i've mentioned wilde always had on hand a sort of job line of weird and wonderful acquaintances whose names were forever on his lips and whose possessions intellectual and otherwise were supposed to be fabulous he would come a few minutes late for lunch and beg to be excused for unpunctuality the fact of the matter is he would say i have spent a most delightful morning with my dear friend mr balsam bassey a charming fellow with a face like a michelangelo drawing and a mind like benvenuto cellini i would have brought him in to lunch he is dying to make your acquaintance but he has to go down to his uncle's place in devonshire and couldn't miss the two fifty on any account there would follow a long and highly elaborate statement of mr balsam bassey's many gifts graces and accomplishments his wonderful powers of conversation the exquisite mo he perpetrated and the charming poetry that he could write if he would only take the trouble to live his own life instead of frivoling it away in the highest circles wilde had to my knowledge at least half a dozen balsam bassies going at one time and though i only saw one of them in the flesh i believe they were real persons and that wilde believed all he had invented about them the solitary balsam bassy he produced on an occasion when he could not help himself as the man sailed right into us at supper turned out to be a very mild and inoffensive gentleman who possessed an allowance of two hundred and fifty pounds a year from his uncle a brewer but with no more talent let alone genius than a box of matches when i observed to wilde that this particular mr balsam bassey did not seem quite to come up to expectations he became very angry and said that the fact that mr balsam bassey was his friend was a sufficient passport for him to any society i said that i thought it was and there the matter dropped the large number of persons of eminence whom wilde knew in a casual way would of course make a long list but of his friends and intimates the people who so to say gyrated immediately around him i have given a full account it should be added that wilde knew beardsley whom he was disposed to patronise and mr george bernard shaw who was then a writer on the star of Shaw he had a high opinion, and prophesied for him a future in a walk of life far other than the one in which he has succeeded. Probably if he had never known Shaw, he would never have written Soul of Man. While Shaw's socialism was a very much redder and more blatant affair in those days than it is now, it attracted Wilde because it was odd, and Shaw was Irish though a mild liberal by pretension wilde was always a rebel in his heart down with everything that's up and up with everything that's down was his intellectual motto if he had not met shaw he would probably have kept his views about the social order of things to himself shaw helped him to a species of socialism which looks very revolutionary but which is rarely designed to benefit the rich rather than the poor like pretty well everything else that wilde wrote the soul of man under socialism fails entirely when you come to look into it it is neither fish flesh fowl nor good red herring and its main argument namely that human beings will never be happy till they've got rid of altruism is of course the obvious reverse of the truth <laughs> 
it may be that the account i have given of wild circle will come with a shock of disappointment to those who have been accustomed to the ross ransom charade versions as to his mode of life the absence of distinguished names is certainly conspicuous but as i am writing the truth and not a fairy story i am compelled to stick to the actual facts which are that wilde during all the time i knew him was not on terms of anything like intimacy with any of the distinguished people of his day he was continually talking of his various eminent contemporaries as if he were on terms of friendship with them he constantly referred to edward burne jones to william morris to ruskin to meredith to tennyson swinburne browning and the rest and he referred to them always as if he had at one time been most friendly with them whether this were or were not the case i have no means of settling authoritatively i can only speak of the period of his life during which i knew him and was continually in his society namely from the year eighteen ninety two to the time of his death and i say positively that during the whole of that time he never had the slightest intercourse with any of the persons mentioned i believe wilde had at one time a slight acquaintance with burne jones but on two occasions when i myself met the latter at clouds the country house of my uncle the late mr percy wyndham i never heard him mention wilde's name i believe he knew ruskin at oxford but only in the way in which any undergraduate could know him if he wished to do so browning he had met once or twice and the same applies to meredith i do not believe that he ever saw or at any rate spoke either to tennyson or swinburne yet to hear him talk of all these people one would have supposed that he was a regular member of their circle when i was with wilde before his downfall and imprisonment i accepted all he told me as to his friendship with the intellectual giants of his time as gospel truth and it was not till long afterwards that it struck me as curious that we never came across any of these celebrities that wilde was never able to get one of them to come to his house and never by any chance went to see them at theirs a good example of wilde's pushfulness in this line of pretended intimacy with celebrated people is furnished by the terms of his dedication of one of his plays to the dear memory of robert earl of lytton i have it on the authority of mr neville lytton the younger son of the late lord lytton that his father scarcely knew wilde and had only met him on one or two occasions and that he might or might not have been flattered by wilde's dedication the same applies to his supposed french acquaintance according to wilde's own account he knew everybody in france who was worth knowing but as a fact he had only the very slightest knowledge of a few of them derived from meeting them once or twice at luncheon or dinner parties at the time he wrote his play salome this question is settled by the articles which have appeared on the subject in france by m henri de Regnier and the vicomte de humieres after he left prison of course nobody knew him but at the very height of his fame and success the facts were as i have stated the same applies to social as opposed to literary and artistic lights when i was twenty-three years of age i was elected to an institution called the crabbit club which had been founded by my cousin mr wilfred blunt the club met once a year at mr wilfred blunt's country house crabbit park for the purpose of playing lawn tennis and reading poems composed by the members of the club for a prize among the members of the club were george curzon now lord curzon of keedlestone george wyndham george leverson gower then comptroller of the queen's household the trinity of georges as someone called them in a prize poem lord horton now lord crewe mr harry cust mr godfrey webb mr mark napier the late lord cairns mr lulu harcourt and a lot more 
Mr. Blunt had made Oscar Wilde a member of this club, and Wilde attended one meeting. It was the custom that any new member should be proposed in a speech at dinner on the first night of the meeting, and opposed by someone else. Wilde was opposed by George Curzon, who attacked him in a brilliant, humorous, witty, but deadly speech, in such a very scathing way that he never could be induced to go to another meeting of the club. As an undoubted member of this club, he certainly could claim to know the other members, and he actually passed one Saturday to Monday at Crabbet in their company. He never forgot it, and never forgot to refer to them by their Christian names ever afterwards, but none of them ever came to Wilde's house, or asked him to his, with the solitary exception of George Wyndham, under circumstances which I've already detailed. On the only occasion on which I attended a meeting of the Cravat Club, I was proposed by George Wyndham, and opposed in a friendly way by Hubert Howard, who was afterwards killed at the Battle of Omdurman. The Crabbit Club was only a club in name. There was no subscription and no entrance fee, and admittance to it was simply by invitation of Mr. Blunt, who used the annual occasion of the meeting of the club as a pretext for a charming and most lavish hospitality. I was actually the last member to join it, and the year I joined was the last year of its existence. One of the rules of the club was that prime ministers, bishops, and viceroys were not eligible for membership, and that any member found guilty of attaining such positions should be at once expelled. Nothing was said about convicts, but when two of the members, Lord Curzon and Lord Horton, became viceroys, and one, Oscar Wilde, was sent to prison, Mr. Blunt came to the conclusion that the Crabbit Club had better be wound up, and it lives now only as a glorious memory, and by virtue of a privately printed volume of prize and other poems, mostly of a satirical nature, which would make the fortune of a dealer in rare books if he could get hold of a copy. I may be excused for mentioning with pride that I won the lawn-tennis tournament of my year, and divided the honours of the prize poem with the late Mr. Godfrey Webb, known as Webber to his numerous friends. To be strictly accurate, Mr. Godfrey Webb was declared the laureate of the year and invested with a laurel wreath, while a special prize was awarded to me for my poem. It was a beautifully bound edition of Surrey's and Wyatt's sonnets, and I regret to say that I left it behind me at Naples, along with a great many other valuable and interesting books, in the charge of Oscar Wilde, when I handed over my villa to him. All these books Wilde sold, or lost, soon after I left Naples. The prize for the lawn tennis tournament I still have in my possession. It is a handsome silver cup of the Georgian period, and is inscribed as follows. In Youth and Crabbed Age. Crabbit Club, 1894. End of chapter 5Chapter Six of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lord Queensbury intervenes. In 1895, my friendship with Oscar Wilde had ripened into an intimacy which was an affair for the gossips. We were inseparable. Wherever Wilde went, I went, and wherever I went, Wilde went. I was living at my mother's house in Cadogan Place, and Wilde at his house in Tite Street. We lunched and dined usually at the Café Royal or at the Savoy. We visited the theatres and music halls of an evening, and we often wound up the day with supper at Willis's rooms. I had left Oxford, and my time was my own. Money did not trouble me much in those days. My father allowed me three hundred and fifty pounds a year for pocket money. The necessaries and luxuries of life were always at my disposal at home and in the houses of my numerous friends and relatives. And whenever I wanted money, 
i had merely to ask my mother or my indulgent grandfather montgomery for it one way or another i dare say i was living at the rate of at least fifteen hundred pounds a year wilde was an expensive sort of friend particularly after he began to consider himself a gourmet and a man of the great world he gave fairly expensive entertainments and although a chop and a pint of bitter beer at some respectable inn would always have done for me i never professed to be insensible to the charms of good cooking and when it came to ordering and paying for a dinner for my friends i was certainly not to be outdone by wilde at the ransom trial among the charges brought against me on the strength of the precious document which mr ross has handed to the british museum was that of extravagance in respect of which i had to meet wild stories of the long departed menus of some of our lucullian feasts it was suggested that we lived on nothing but delicious ortolans by the way are there any ortolans that are not delicious and foie gras from strasbourg which we made a point of washing down with perrier jouet and topped off with fifty-year-old brandy of course i do not profess to remember what i had for dinner twenty years ago but any man about town knows that one can dine very comfortably for a sovereign and i happen to remember that wilde always considered a sovereign quite a good deal of money it was further suggested that between the autumn of eighteen ninety two and the date of his imprisonment that is to say in less than three years wilde spent with me and on me more than five thousand pounds in actual money irrespective of the bills he incurred but in plain terms this means that he spent at least forty pounds a week in entertaining me so that for three years i must have been eating three meals a day and twenty-one meals a week at a cost and charge of two pounds a meal with oscar wilde i cannot have dispersed a penny on myself or on him and at the end of the three years i ought to have had a thousand or two in the bank and a stone or two of flesh to spare in point of fact even in those early days i spent a great deal more money on wilde than he spent on me and my weight has stood at less than ten stone five ever since i can remember which for a man of my height does not point to much gormandizing it is a pretty thing that any gentleman should be compelled to go into such matters but as the world has already been told and is to be told again in nineteen sixty that i got through five thousand pounds worth of wilde's ortolans and perrier jouet in three years i here and now venture to tell the world that i did nothing of the kind in the three years in question it is exceedingly doubtful whether wilde ever had five thousand pounds at his disposal he had developed expensive tastes in many other directions besides food and drink he dressed expensively he wore expensive jewellery he made presents of jewellery and money to all sorts of ridiculous people the upkeep of his house in tight street must have run him into at least a thousand a year he travelled a good deal and made expensive stays in paris at homburg and in italy and not to put too fine a point on it he was continually short of money on several occasions i borrowed money from moneylenders at his suggestion and instigation and he invariably helped himself liberally not only to these sums but to sums of money which i obtained from my mother and from my other relatives indeed so far as my money was concerned we had a common purse it never occurred to me to refuse him anything nothing was too good for him and i always regarded him as a man who although he might have spurts of money was without proper income and resources and was consequently to be helped out whenever occasion demanded to take an instance in point just before the woman of no importance was put on at the haymarket i went to a money-lender and borrowed two hundred and fifty pounds at lunch i showed wilde the money in ten-pound notes 
and he took them into his hand and said how beautiful they are and how wonderful it is of you to be able to get them then with a laugh he put five or six of them into his own pocket and handed me the balance i thought no more about it at the moment than i should have thought of sharing a bottle of wine with him indeed i got the money with the intention of giving him some of it because he had been groaning for over a week about his hard upness this is only one instance of many all my life i have been free-handed and careless about money i was well over thirty years of age before it dawned upon me that money did not grow on the trees of the family estate there are plenty of people who are now living who know me well and i should like to hear one of them who would tell me that i am thrifty or that i permit my friends to pay out of their turn it is true that wilde and i were for a long period on terms of friendship which were quite outside and beyond the you ask me to dinner and i ask you back again principle but it is grotesquely untrue to suggest that he wasted any appreciable part of his substance upon me wilde had a great way of making everything appear important he was very fond of sending for the managers of restaurants to consult them over the merits of wine or to bid them summon the chef to receive instruction or compliment as the case might be these were not practices of mine and never have been up to the time of my meeting oscar wilde i had been accustomed to live at great houses and the best food and the best drink were the only sort i knew about it never occurred to me that wilde's exquisite spreads were anything out of the ordinary i suppose the cooking at the cafe royal or at the savoy hotel is good but it is certainly to say the least no better than what one gets in a good house or at a good club wilde made fusses and went through elaborate rituals over the ordering of his meals i for my part ordered ate and paid for them and thought nothing further about it as i have said our constant appearances together at cafes restaurants theatres and public places set the gossips wagging their tongues i heard all sorts of rumours which were silly on the face of them and which were a good deal sillier when one thought about them naturally i ignored them utterly i am convinced that some of the whispers and hints that went around were set going by persons who deemed that i had supplanted them in wilde's good graces and who were annoyed because while he still continued to know them he ceased in a great measure to frequent their company in any case i was made to feel that certain people were very sore about my monopolising wilde egged on doubtless by what she heard even mrs wilde with whom i always had been on the most friendly terms began to say that i took up a great deal too much of oscar's time and wilde once told me that she had made difficulties about our being so much together i told him that we certainly did seem to be always together and i offered to go away and leave him to his own devices but he said that this would be unbearable to him and that he had made mrs wilde understand and that he had mentioned the matter to me in the idlest way and without any notion that i should be so foolish as to take him seriously so our lives drifted along as usual i may here mention that for the first three years of my close intimacy with oscar wilde i never heard a coarse or indelicate allusion come out of his mouth i know him for a somewhat cynical and insincere kind of humorist i was not blind to his faults of vanity and his occasional lapses into vulgar manners i knew he was no saint even as men of the world go but i considered that he was a man of decent life and i never heard from him a word or a sign which made me think otherwise he treated me always with the greatest and i may even say the most elaborate courtesy and i noticed particularly that when we were in the society of men who were apt to kick somewhat over the traces and indulge in rabelaisian conversation wilde was eagerly careful to turn or suppress the talk 
he therefore seemed to be all that a man should be and when i heard on one or two occasions certain other hints of tendencies of his i repudiated them with indignation believing that as i was his close friend i knew him through and through and feeling that there could not possibly be any truth in what was suggested some years before i met wilde my mother had found it desirable to divorce my father and at the time to which i am now referring the family relationships were not exactly running smooth to be quite frank i had conceived feelings of resentment against my father on account of his treatment of my mother which i am afraid were far from filial you may judge then of my anger when wilde one day told me that lord queensbury had sent him a letter in which he requested wilde to terminate his friendship with me at once inasmuch as he did not think it would be beneficial to me wilde asked me what he should do and i told him to take no notice of the letter later my father sent me a letter in which he told me what he had said to wilde and threatened to cut off my allowance if i did not at once terminate the acquaintance i was not aware of any grounds upon which lord queensbury could make such a request and concluded that he had written to me for the mere purpose of annoyance and because he knew that i had taken sides with my mother since the divorce proceedings consequently i sent him a fairly stinging reply and a heated correspondence followed portions of that correspondence have been preserved in glass cases by careful lawyers and these relics of an unpleasant feud have been brought up against me in various cross-examinations with a view to proving that i was an unfilial brute and that i treated my own father very badly in the light of what has happened since i know that i was hasty and mistaken but one cannot be the son of the eighth marquis of queensbury nor a member of the family of douglas without having the defects of one's qualities i did not sit down to the abuse of my father in the manner of a person without spirit for the very simple reason that i am not devoid of spirit and never shall be however before he died my father sent for me and there was a complete reconciliation between us and he left me every shilling that could possibly be arranged for me out of his very considerable estate failing to make disruption between myself and wilde lord queensbury adopted a different line of tactics and i believe with the sincere view of saving me from what he knew was an undesirable entanglement he went ahead to disgrace wilde publicly at a theatre where one of wilde's plays was running he caused a bouquet of carrots to be handed up to wilde over the footlights and he left his card on him at his club with certain odious remarks written on the back of it i need scarcely say that wilde was very much distressed he came to me in a great state about it and said that it was most wicked and cruel of my father to treat him in this way and that unless an immediate apology was forthcoming he would have no alternative but to prosecute lord queensbury for criminal libel i was a little bit nettled at the tone he took as he seemed to imply by his air that i was in some way to blame for what had happened and i said at once you are not in the least likely to get apologies from my father and so far as i am concerned you can prosecute and be blowed it has been widely asserted that i went out of my way to instigate these proceedings against my father it is quite certain that i did not go on my bended knees to ask wilde not to take proceedings he assured me that the suggestions and accusation against him were quite false and without foundation i had not the smallest reason to suppose that he was lying to me and i undoubtedly allowed matters to take their course i will go further and say that in a sense i was not sorry that lord queensbury should be brought to book for what i considered to be his very bad treatment of both myself and wilde i went with wilde at his request to see a lawyer on the subject this lawyer had been recommended to him by robert ross who also accompanied us on this occasion he advised proceedings 
and we went to Bow Street and procured a warrant for my father's arrest. On the morning the warrant was executed, Wilde came to me in a condition bordering on hysteria, told me that he had no money, and that at least three hundred pounds were required in order that the case might go on. At his urgent solicitation, I gave him three hundred and sixty pounds to give to his solicitor. The figures appear in my bank book and were proved at the ransom trial. This, I am told, was most unnatural conduct. Wilde, for his part, pointed out that it was entirely through his friendship for me that he had to suffer Lord Queensbury's insults, and that unless he went on with the prosecution, he would be branded throughout Europe for a person of vicious and abominable life, and that, as I had been the means of getting him into trouble, it would be a poor thing if I would not find a few hundreds to get him out again. What was I to do, and what would any man so placed have done? I should have liked to have quoted verbatim Wilde's version of this episode as it was put to me at the ransom trial, but since the manuscript of this book was completed, Mr. Robert Ross has obtained an injunction against me by which I am precluded from quoting any part of the unpublished De Profundis manuscript. This unpublished part has been used against me in the most frightful manner, Venomous passages have been read in open court and reproduced in hundreds of newspapers, and yet I understand I am debarred from quoting from it for the purpose of replying to it and pointing out its obvious falsity. It is unnecessary for me to enlarge on the absolute negation of every principle of justice and common sense which is involved in such a decision. It is too obvious for that. I do not say that such decision may not be a correct interpretation of the law as it exists, though it is hard to believe it. What I do say is that the existence of such a law is a disgrace and a danger to the community, for it is obvious that under its provisions any man can foully slander another and so arrange his slander that reply to it becomes impossible during the lifetime of the slandered. For example, there is nothing to prevent me from writing a long letter, say, to Mr. Justice Astbury, the judge who granted Mr. Ross the interim injunction restraining me from quoting passages from the unpublished De Profundis. I can, if I please, accuse him in this letter of every sort of crime and impute to him every kind of baseness. I can attack his parents and his relations, and I can ascribe to him imaginary words alleged to have been spoken by him, and I can invent imaginary scenes in which I allege that he has taken part. All I have to do is hand this letter to a friend, and give him instructions that after my death it is to be placed in the British Museum, and kept there till such time as the friend may think fitting to bring it out and publish it. If Mr. Justice Asprey should happen to outlive me, and if he should thereupon by some chance get knowledge of the fact that a long epistle addressed to him and containing a violent attack on his character is lying in the British Museum and is to be published in fifty years' time, he will be powerless to take the smallest step to prevent the publication of this posthumous libel, and he will not even be able to defend himself against the accusations it contains." The copyright in the manuscript will be the property of my heirs and executors, and should Mr. Justice Asbury propose to quote any part of it with a view to showing its scandalous and ridiculous falsity, he will immediately be pulled up by the law of copyright. My slanderous and shameful letter will be a valuable literary property, for Mr. Justice Asbury to quote passages from it would be injurious to its market value. In vain he would protest that he was surely entitled to defend himself against an attack made on him by a dead man, and designed to be made public to the world after his own death. He would simply be told that the law is quite clear, and he would have to grin and bear it as well as he could, just as I have to do under precisely similar circumstances. What I can, at any rate, legitimately do, 
even within the narrow compass which mr justice asbury's interpretation of the law allows me is to set out the true facts connected with this period of wilde's career and my own connection with it i desire firstly to state emphatically that i did not force wilde into taking proceedings against my father the matter can be summed up in a few sentences my father had accused wilde of certain abominations these accusations it seems were true wilde denied the truth of them to me and proceeded to take up what in view of the facts known to himself and not to me was a ridiculous prosecution against my father he was of course beaten and the authorities turned upon him and convicted him of crimes which he had denied then i became a convenient scapegoat i did not drag wilde down to bow street to procure a warrant i went with him but at his own request the suggestion of coercion either moral or physical is ridiculous here was the king of life a great big fat strong fellow full of brains and forty-one years of age in the prime of his splendid manhood as one of his admirers puts it and i was sixteen years his junior that is to say twenty-four years of age the real fact is that he had something inside him that i knew nothing about namely and to wit a guilty conscience he was too much of a coward to tell me that he was guilty of the charges the marquis of queensbury had levelled at him and he was too much of a coward even to go to bow street for a warrant alone so he came whimpering to me to go with him i did not coerce or cajole wilde into going to monte carlo at this time nor did wilde pay my expenses or my gambling losses wilde said his nerves were all broken up he had never been to monte carlo and we went there in order that he might be distracted from the question of the trial upon which he seemed to brood a great deal believing him to be an innocent man i told him that he was a fool to worry and that it was the other side who ought to do the worrying and we went to monte carlo i have frequently been to monte carlo and i have never in my life spent more than two hours at a stretch in the rooms on this particular occasion i was less frequently in the rooms and for less periods of time than i have ever been before or since largely because wilde was with me more often than not he was with me in the rooms and i gave him more than one handful of louis out of my winnings he never had the pluck to put a louis on the table because as i have said he always felt that a gold piece was a good deal of money in any case does it stand to reason that a man who had no money wherewith to pay his solicitor's fees was the kind of man one would take to monte carlo to pay one's hotel expenses and casino losses no one but a fool would pretend to believe such a farrago of rubbish wilde's friends including the never-to-be-forgotten robert sherard with the face like a roman emperor whom wilde thought perfectly wonderful have echoed the cry that i was the author of his disaster and downfall even mrs wilde writes to tell sherard that i had marred a fine life mr ransom who tells his readers that he derives his biographical facts from ross says it in print all these people should surely have been aware that the person who ruined oscar wilde and brought about his disaster and marred his life was oscar wilde himself he was not charged at the old bailey for having taken proceedings against the marquis of queensbury but for having made a low squalid and abominable brute of himself they prefer to assume that he was convicted on false evidence and to speak always of me as the author of his debacle their great point seems to be that if he had not known me he would probably never have been found out and might have passed down to posterity for one of those highly respectable persons of whom he professes to be so contemptuous and if this be their point i will cheerfully concede it to them it was also a charge against me again on wilde's word only that i was 
at the time of his trouble, attacking him with loathsome letters. Now, what does this mean, and what is the suggestion? Where are those letters, and how could I be accusing him in letters on the one hand, and putting up money to defend him from these very accusations on the other? I had written him no loathsome letters. All I had written after our conversation on the subject was a letter in which I confirmed my opinion that, as he was innocent of these charges, he had no alternative but to proceed against my father. Yet this was brought against me as being as loathsome as the cards on which my father had been charging him with a terrible offence. The truth was that Wilde, having once decided to take proceedings against my father, made up his mind that, if they failed, I was to be responsible for everything. End of chapter 6「Seven of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wilde Trials All the world knows that the proceedings against my father broke down, as it was only natural that they should. Wilde had a guilty mind, which he was careful to hide from me, and he attributed his defeat to a foul and hideous conspiracy and not to the fact that my father had merely spoken the truth. One of his biographers has given a highly melodramatic account of what happened after the collapse of the prosecution. Says the writer in question, At that moment, my friend, with some companions, was sitting in a private room in the Cadogan Arms, Seek, smoking cigarettes, drinking whiskey and soda, and waiting, what for waiting, Seek, not one of them could have said. They had set fire to a mine and were trying to stupefy themselves into the belief and hope that it would not explode beneath them. It was reported to me that when, after an intentional delay of many hours, unable to wait any longer, the police at last moved and a knock came at the door of that sitting-room in the Cadogan Arms, they all blanched as if under the shock of a sudden surprise. Not one of his friends had the sense to explain to Wilde what was the true meaning of the warning his counsel had given at the close of his cross-examination, or to force him to realise that, if only as a matter of public policy, he should leave the country at once. As a matter of fact, the warrant for his arrest was not signed until after the last day train for dover carefully watched had been sent to leave without him and it was impossible to delay action any longer the inexactitudes herein set forward are as beautiful as they are numerous in the first place this wonderful biographer's friend never sat with some companions in a private room in the cadogan arms smoking cigarettes and drinking whiskies and soda Wilde's companions, for reasons best known to themselves, disappeared like snowflakes on a river the moment it was known that Sir Edward Clarke had withdrawn from the proceedings against my father. The only person left with him at this precise juncture happens to have been myself. We were both well aware that Wilde's arrest might follow on what had happened, and Wilde was not only sure that he was about to be arrested, but he told me that in all likelihood they would arrest me also. I did my best to cheer him up, and I pointed out to him that they were welcome to indulge in any amount of arresting, since he said himself that he had done nothing, and I knew that I had done nothing. I had a suite of rooms at the Cadogan Hotel, not arms, Mr. Sherrard, if you please, in Sloane Street, and I drove wild there from the Old Bailey, after we had lunched at the Hoban Hotel. I never saw a man more broken up or more nervously anxious about himself. He kept on tearfully protesting that it was a vile and hideous conspiracy against him, and that the suspense would kill him. I managed to bring him to reason somewhat by talking to him pretty plainly, 
and in order to help him with the suspense difficulty i went down to the house of commons to see my cousin george wyndham and asked him if he could find out what the authorities intended to do wyndham saw me in the lobby and after making inquiries in the house came out and told me that sir robert reed had told him that there was to be a prosecution i went back to the cadogan hotel and found there not oscar wilde but a letter in which he told me he'd been arrested and would have to pass the night at bow street and asking me to see various people on the question of bail and also to come to bow street and try to see him this letter i had intended to produce in facsimile but the amiable mr ross has obtained an injunction which prevents me from doing so there was never any question of his leaving the country until the time when he was out on bail according to his own showing he had no reason for leaving the country other than to avoid the inconvenience of a criminal trial in any case he could not have left because he was shadowed by detectives from the moment he had left the old bailey that morning so far from sitting in private rooms and endeavouring to stupefy ourselves with cigarettes and whisky we had spent the hour after lunch in going round to george lewis the solicitor to see if he could do anything he said it was too late for anything to be done and that if the matter had been taken to him in the first instance he would simply have destroyed my father's card and told wilde not to be a fool in view of mr ross's attempt to attribute wilde's downfall to my bad advice it is singular that i had recommended him to go to mr lewis if he had done so there would have been no prosecution as it was he went to mr ross's own solicitor mr humphreys who advised the prosecution which proved so disastrous i do not think that the grounds upon which sir edward clarke withdrew from the proceedings against my father have ever been stated and consequently i set them out herewith sir edward clarke like myself believed in wilde's innocence he looked upon him as more or less of a madman who did everything that was foolish and unwise for the mere sake of appearing eccentric or superior but he nevertheless believed that he was innocent of any actual viciousness after sir edward carson's cross-examination of wilde there was a conference and sir edward clarke pointed out that it would be impossible to get over the prejudice created in the minds of the jury by wilde's admissions in the witness-box sir edward carson had made great use of the picture of dorian gray in the course of the cross-examination and passages had been read which obviously pointed to a most objectionable attitude of mind on the part of the author towards certain vices sir edward clarke advised that when the proceedings opened next day no further evidence should be offered against the marquis of queensbury and that the case against him should be abandoned on the ground that what wilde had written and published in dorian gray would be sufficient to justify a reasonable person in supposing that wilde sympathised with the vices in question it should be pointed out that my father had not accused wilde of the actual practice of these vices on the card which he left at wilde's club he had written an accusation against wilde as posing as a vicious person sir edward clarke was of the opinion that if the course indicated were taken the defence would be more or less appeased and that wilde would to some extent save his face and lessen the risks of a subsequent prosecution if you withdraw from the case now said sir edward it will be a nine days talk but you will probably hear no more about it so far as the authorities are concerned if you continue and lord queensbury is found not guilty they will in all probability arrest you in court mr now sir charles matthews who was also counsel for wilde agreed with sir edward and it was decided to withdraw everybody who writes about this part of the proceedings contrives to suggest that sir edward clarke threw up the sponge in disgust and without wilde's consent or knowledge 
in point of fact wilde consented to the withdrawal and so far from throwing him over as a client both sir edward clarke and sir charles matthews defended him in the two subsequent trials and what is more defended him for nothing on returning to the cadogan hotel and finding that wilde had been arrested i went straight to bow street and offered bail for his temporary release i was told that bail could not be accepted that night and that if bail were accepted at all other securities besides myself would be required i went off at once to see mr now sir george alexander and mr lewis waller at whose theatres wilde's plays were running and asked them to offer bail in the letter wilde left for me at the cadogan he requested me to see these gentlemen for that purpose they both refused between the time of his arrest and of his trial at the old bailey wilde was kept at holloway prison and either there or at bow street i visited him daily for a period of three or four weeks there was nobody else to come near him his companions had left the country his wife would have nothing to do with him and his general acquaintance was going about london protesting that it had never known him it is the fashion to say that i deserted him at the ransom trial mr campbell k c had the face to put it to me that i fled the country if a daily pilgrimage to holloway and daily interviews with a prisoner are desertion and fleeing the country then my gentle detractors are right without the slightest intention of benefit to me a certain person has made public a letter which states that my daily visits were the only things which quickened wilde into life and here is a portion of a letter which i myself had occasion to write to this same person i saw oscar yesterday in a private room at the police court and he gave me your three letters and asked me to write and tell you how deeply touched he was by your kindness and sympathy and loyalty to him in his terrible and undeserved trouble he himself is so ill and unhappy that he has not sufficient strength and energy to write and all his time has to be devoted to preparing his defence against a diabolical conspiracy which seems almost unlimited in its size and strength i will not add to your sorrow by telling you of the privations and sufferings he has to endure i have seen him three times since his arrest once through a horrible kind of barred cage separated from him by a space of one yard and in almost complete darkness with twenty other people talking at the same time this is the ordinary way and one visit a day of a quarter of an hour is all he is allowed after that i managed to get an order from the home secretary to see him in a private room for three quarters of an hour and yesterday i contrived to have a fairly long interview with him at the police court in spite of all the brutal and cowardly clamour of our disgusting newspapers i think the sympathy of all decent men is with him and that he will ultimately triumph but he has much to go through first i have determined to remain here and do what i possibly can though i am warned on all hands that my own risk is not inconsiderable and my family implore me to go away it is plain on the whole therefore that desertion and fleeing the country are rather out of the picture during the time that wilde lay in holloway prison i began to have a certain amount of doubt as to his innocence in our repeated conversations he clung to the conspiracy fiction with considerable persistence as the time for the trial drew near however he began to weaken and eventually he admitted that there were things in his life which could be made to look pretty awkward but this was as far as he would go his one anxiety seemed to be that i should not give him up and i always told him that i never would one day he said to me even if these horrible tales were true you would stick to me wouldn't you and i said of course i would it was not until the day before the trial that he made anything like a proper attempt to unburden himself 
it had been arranged that i should see him in a private room on this day and that we should have a longer interview than was permitted by the regulations we talked on general matters for some time but ultimately wilde became very serious and said that he did not see how it was possible for him to hope for a verdict of not guilty he then went on to tell me that in a way the charges set forward in the indictment were true and that he must have been mad to live as he had been living and that his only hope was that the skill of clark and matthews might save him from the severest punishment he reminded me of my promise not to forsake him and though i was shocked at what he told me i am free to confess that it never entered into my mind that it was my duty forthwith to give up his acquaintance i told him that what he had said should not make any difference and that i would stick to him through thick and thin in the meanwhile great pressure was being brought to bear on me by my family to leave the country my father's advisers put up the very worst reason they could have chosen to get me to do this they pretended that as my name had been so continually linked with wilde's and as a silly letter he had addressed to me had been read in court i was under some danger of being arrested and charged with him such threats did not move me in the least rather they confirmed me in my determination to stop where i was during those unpleasant days i seemed almost to live at bow street or holloway so that if the police had wanted me they knew where to find me then sir edward clark took a hand quite independently i believe of the suggestion from my family he pointed out that my continued association with wilde after the collapse of the case against my father was creating all sorts of comment and prejudice and that it would be much better for wilde if i went abroad when i put it to wilde he said that he quite agreed with sir edward clark and that i should be obliging him and putting him in a better position in the eyes of the world if i remained away during the trial even with this assurance i was not satisfied and i asked wilde to think it over and put it into writing which he did i thereupon left england for paris the result of the trial was that the jury disagreed there had been six counts in the indictment and the prosecution had brought up all sorts of extraordinary evidence but the jury could not come to a unanimous verdict it had been said and i believe with truth that only one juror stood out in wilde's favour in any case there was the fact of no verdict and the authorities had to consider their position they decided to have a new trial and wilde was taken back to holloway it was arranged that he should be admitted to bail until the new trial took place if sureties to the amount of two thousand five hundred pounds were forthcoming my brother percy then lord douglas of howick and now marquis of queensbury and the reverend stuart headlam became bail for the amount i have often thought that the supremely tragical period of wilde's life was not the moment of his taking action against my father as he suggested but the period during which he was out on bail with the second trial looming ahead of him i have reason for knowing that wilde looked upon the disagreement of the jury as a sort of verdict in his favour and was under the impression that he stood a very good sporting chance of being found not guilty at the second trial it is notorious that persons afflicted with wilde's particular type of viciousness are forever believing that the world will one day condone and even approve of them wilde looked upon the one juryman who refused to find him guilty not as an honest englishman who was determined to satisfy himself on the evidence but as a friend or approver of unnameable wickedness he argued if there was one man of this jury who was with me there is sure to be one on the next and as it was evident that people were becoming tired of the scandal and the press which in the beginning had pursued him with relentless and bloodthirsty fierceness 
had calmed down a good deal he began to think that he would get off for my own part i do not profess to have had great wisdom but it happens that i did not think that he would get off and rightly or wrongly i advised him to leave the country i wrote to my brother percy and asked him if he would mind if wilde made a bolt of it the matter was put to wilde and he refused to budge his brother is reputed to have said oscar is an irish gentleman and will face the music it has been held up to him for nobility that he did remain and i have frequently seen it stated that he remained because he did not wish to be dishonourable with respect to his bail his bail however would not have complained if he had gone yet he stopped here again the tragedy was entirely of his own making even if we are to believe that wilde abandoned his will-power entirely to me when he went to bow street for his warrant how comes it to pass that when he was at oakley street without a shilling or a friend and a public exposure behind him of the like no man ever had in all history his will-power suddenly reasserts itself i have been blamed for suggesting that he should go away on the other hand the very people who blamed me for advising his retreat when i knew that he was guilty have blamed me for not advising him to get away when i supposed him to be innocent i take no shame whatever for having advised him as i did his withdrawal to france would have cost my brother two thousand five hundred pounds and heaven alone knows what it would have cost me in hard money but it would have saved wilde two years of imprisonment and it would have saved literature from the ultimate degradation at his hands for it is obvious that if he had remained a free man he would not have degraded himself and the english language by writing de profundis i have already produced the statement of one of wilde's biographers as to the manner in which wilde and his companions are alleged to have spent the hours between the collapse of the case against lord queensbury and wilde's arrest but i should like once more to call attention to the sentence about the police knocking at the door of the sitting-room at the cadogan arms and the blanched faces and sudden surprise of wilde and his companions here is another account of what happened oscar wilde had spent that afternoon in a private sitting-room at a hotel smoking cigarettes drinking whisky and soda and reading now the yellow book and now evening papers he evinced neither dismay nor trepidation when the officers entered the room and on alighting from the cab at scotland yard he had a courteous discussion with one of the detectives about the payment of the cab it will interest the reader to know that both these accounts though they are diametrically opposed one to the other are the work of the same person namely robert harborough sherard it is the same mr sherard who tells the following fearful and wonderful anecdote late in the afternoon of the following day saturday twenty fifth may eighteen ninety five oscar wilde was found guilty and sentenced to two years hard labour there had been six counts against him he was asked after his release by a very old friend as to the justice of the finding and he said five of the counts referred to matters with which i had absolutely nothing to do there was some foundation for one of the counts but then why asked his friend did you not instruct your defenders that would have meant betraying a friend said oscar circumstances which have since transpired have established what for the rest was never in doubt in the minds of those who heard it made the absolute truth of this statement presuming that wilde said this he must have taken for granted that those who heard him had suddenly become idiots the six counts of the indictment bore reference to his improper relations with different persons all of whom were produced in the witness box and gave their evidence in wilde's presence if a friend had been involved in the slightest way 
that friend's name would most assuredly have leaked out in the course of the proceedings and if twenty friends had been involved and their names had been kept secret wilde's position would not have been bettered in the slightest degree or his guilt any the less plainly established wilde was not of the stuff that goes to hard labour with the name of a friend in his bosom when by mentioning that name he could have cleared himself his whole principle of life was subversive to any such high altruism he would not have gone without his dinner to save a friend much less have faced ruin and imprisonment End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Oscar Wilde and Myself by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hard Labour and After. To say that I was distressed by the sentence of two years' imprisonment with hard labour, imposed upon Wilde by a judge who seemed to be absolutely without mercy, is to put a mild term upon my condition of anguish wilde and his supporters never ceased to suggest that the whole thing was my fault they never blamed him for what he had done but went about calling my father opprobrious names and asserting that i had been wilde's ruin it pleased them to have a scapegoat upon whom to shift the moral responsibilities of this big fat man and with the help of a foolish letter or two which i had written at moments of great stress they shifted them to some purpose i have no desire to be merely mouthed about the suggestions which have been made and i will say right out what impression it is that these people have tried to create from the time that wilde went to prison they have suggested that i alfred bruce douglas was a partner in the vices of which wilde was charged and convicted there has been more or less established the legend that it was i who took him from the path of rectitude and introduced him to the kennels of foulness and the impression has been created that i led a debauched life with him prior to his imprisonment and that when he came out and was willing to mend his ways and be reconciled to his wife it was i who seduced him and dragged him back to his old villainies i observe that mr ransom has the following note to the edition of his critical study which has lately been published at a shilling the publication of this book in nineteen twelve was the subject of a libel action which was brought against me in the king's bench division of the high court of justice and was heard before mr justice darling and a special jury on four days in april nineteen thirteen in that action a verdict was given in my favour in bringing out this new edition i have considered the question of reprinting the book in its original form as i have the perfect right to do but as i do not consider that the passages complained of are essential to the critical purpose of my book i have decided in order to spare the feelings of those who might be pained by the further publication of those passages to omit them from this edition mr ransom's desire to spare people's feelings by omitting from his book what is not true is wonderfully creditable to him but the fact remains that he asserted in his first edition that wilde owed some at least of the circumstances of his public disgrace to me while the exquisite mr sherard goes further and embellishes his authoritative life with the following passage he was then living in naples the circumstances under which he had been obliged to leave berneval and return to the least desirable companionship that the world of men offered to his choice are summed up in the following sentence by the author of twenty years in paris the time came however when being without money repulsed desolate he could no longer resist entreaties which offered to him companionship in the place of utter loneliness friendship in the place of hostility homage in the place of insult 
and in the place of impending destitution a luxurious and elegant hospitality it is well known that it was i who offered him a sanctuary at naples when his money had run out and he was reduced to a paltry allowance of two pounds nineteen and sixpence a week and i submit that the sentence italicised in the above quoted passage is intended to mean and can only mean one thing while ransom's assertion is capable of the worst interpretation and now we come to the inner secret of the whole of the abominable business when wilde went to prison i was in france by his own request i wrote to him the moment i heard of the sentence and there can be no doubt whatever that up to this point we were good friends and that he counted me his chiefest and dearest friend i set to work immediately to do what i could for him in the way of trying to get his sentence reduced and trying to obtain for him special privileges in prison in pursuance of my promise and my natural desire to stick to him through thick and thin i even went the length of writing to certain newspapers with a view to showing that what he had done would not have been considered so very terrible by many eminent people that his offence was no offence at all in france and that his sentence was altogether out of proportion to his crime when one came to consider the amount of suffering a sentence of two years hard labour would entail upon a man of his nature and temperament in addition to engaging myself in these efforts on wilde's behalf i was kept continually busy repelling all sorts of stupid attacks on myself wilde's conviction and the curiosity and scandal aroused by what transpired at the trial seems to have driven the whole of paris into a state of madness for the time being statements of the most ridiculous kind about wilde myself were published broadcast articles were printed which purported to be written by me and were signed in my name though i had never so much as seen them and one paper went the length of printing a number of gallant letters which i was alleged to have addressed to a certain well-known demi-mondaine a lady by the way to whom i had never written or spoken in my life i spent a great deal of time and temper in endeavouring to cope with these matters i challenged various people to jewels and i took actions at law against various newspapers but i soon found that it was next door to impossible to keep track of my traducers and that i might easily have spent the rest of my life in litigation without obtaining redress about this time i wrote for the mercure de france an article about wilde which might have done him a certain amount of good in the literary sense sherard heard in some way that this article had been written he mentioned it to wilde in prison and on the strength of what wilde said sherard wrote me a letter stating that wilde desired that the article should not appear i gave sherard his immediate and proper answer and as it was nothing to me whether the article appeared or not unless wilde wished it to appear i arranged with the mercure de france that it should not be printed in the meantime i decided to go to england and to visit wilde in prison in order that we might talk generally of his affairs i wrote informing robert ross of my intention and in reply he told me that he had just come from wilde and that as his correspondence and visitors were strictly limited he desired that i should neither write to him nor visit him i said that i thought such a request ought to have come to me directly from wilde either by word of mouth or by letter but ross told me that prisoners were allowed to write only a limited number of letters in the year and to see only a limited number of visitors and that he had already written as many letters as he was entitled to write and would be unable either to receive letters or visitors for some time to come i was very much upset on receiving this news and i had some thought of trying to obtain an interview with wilde through influence which i possessed but i was told that it would be bad for wilde if i did so and i accordingly determined to follow out his wishes and to wait until he could write or send to me
i subsequently went to naples and occupied myself with literary pursuits getting together a volume of poetry which i proposed to publish and dedicate to wilde now it is quite clear that during the latter part of his imprisonment wilde laboured under the impression that my silence and my failure to visit him were due to carelessness indifference and apathy on my part either he did not know or pretended not to know of the precise intimations given to me not to visit or write to him as he did not hear from me he concluded that i had forsaken him this filled him with a violent anger and he set to work and wrote de profundis his rage and hate apparently knew no limits and sherard published a letter of mrs wilde's in which she states that she had seen her husband in prison and that he had said that if he could get hold of blank meaning myself he would kill him and all this time i was thinking hourly of the man who had been my friend and counting the days to the time of his release i had steady reports of him from ross but never a word or a hint that he was angry with me or that i had done anything to offend him until he had nearly completed his sentence the only indication of the sort that came my way was in the matter of the dedication of my first volume of poems ross wrote to say that wilde felt that it would be better if i did not dedicate the book to him and as he wished it i refrained and issued the book without any dedication at all of wilde in prison we have had many touching and woeful pictures sherard has a passage about it which in the circumstances is worth quoting in wandsworth prison first and then in reading jail oscar wilde's mental development reached a point of transcendency to which never in the world of men he could have hoped to attain there had been forced upon him the recluse life which had raised many men in the world's history towards the stars but which perhaps never before demonstrated its reforming and enhancing powers in a manner more magnificent more orbicular more triumphant in the old days he had tried to imitate balzac in his mode of life but society and pleasure had ever knocked at the door of his cell nor had he the strength of will great enough to resist their allurements now there were iron bars between him and the wasteful pleasures of the world a claustration as strict if less severe than that which balzac imposed upon himself held him fast and he had the time to think he had the time to think and with a brain which at last had recovered its splendid normal power the prison regime the enforced temperance in food the enforced abstinence from all narcotic drugs and drink the regular hours the periodical exercise the simple life in one word had restored him the splendid heritage that he had received from nature what the real oscar wilde was and of what he was capable was now to be made patent in de profundis he laid his soul bare and the impartial are to judge from that book of the man's new powers as a thinker and as a literary artist his friends will ask no more than that reserving to themselves the high delight of taking a holy joy in the lofty virtues which that book reveals the kindness the patience the resignation the forgiveness of sins so splendid that one may almost believe that in his ardent meditations on christ he was able to bring the bodily presence of the god who taught these things into his cell and to learn from the divine lips themselves what is the true secret of human happiness critics abroad have said there is too much about christ in de profundis overlooking the fact that the book is from the first page to the last inspired by christ that no man who had not found christ could have written that book nor lived as the man who wrote it did live in england one heard it said that it is absurd to believe that an agnostic a sensualist would turn to religion and the blasphemous statement has been made that this book is in its way no more sincere than the dying confessions of many prison cells the greasy cant that officious chaplains win from fawning prisoners 
one has heard the word hypocrisy pronounced. This is very precious writing, and quite typical of the ecstatic frame of mind of the average wild enthusiast. Unlike Mr. Ransom, however, Mr. Sherard does not appear to have had the advantage of knowing that the published De Profundis, which aroused him to such a pitch of pietistic fervour, is merely a collection of elegant extracts. A perusal of the extracts from the complete De Profundis, published in reports of the Ransom trial, would have convinced him that this saint-like inhabitant of Wandsworth and Reading jails was indeed a hypocrite of the most hypocritical dye, and that the De Profundis was indeed no more sincere than the dying confessions of many prison cells, the greasy cant that officious chaplains wring from fawning prisoners. Nay, it was worse than this, for the design of the canting deceiver of prison chaplains is not usually to hurt other people, whereas Wilde's design was utterly to destroy the reputation and good name of a man who had befriended him, and to do this in such a way that he might still continue to obtain kindness and money from the object of his hatred, and leave him absolutely without a word of defence in his lifetime. I say that Oscar Wilde conceived this horrible and unheard-of plot in his unreasoning rage at what he conceived to be my attitude towards him, and I say that Mr. Robert Ross, who professed great friendship for me both then and until long after Wilde's death, did nothing to make Wilde's plot ineffective, or even to warn me of it. On the contrary, he presented the unpublished parts of De Profundis to the authorities at the British Museum on the understanding that it was to remain sealed up only until the year 1960. However, I shall deal with the whole question of De Profundis in a separate chapter. My main point here is to show plainly what has been brought to my charge, and to show how the people who bring these charges stultify themselves. Nobody who reads Mr. Ransom's book before, out of the kindness of his heart, he removed his aspersions on me, could doubt for a moment that he wished to convey the impression that I had a bad influence upon Wilde, and that it was this bad influence that brought Wilde to grief, and prevented him from rehabilitating himself after his release. Yet it is this same Mr. Ransom, who tells his readers in his preface that he is indebted to Mr. Ross for verifications of his biographical facts, who gives us the following precise details as to the intensification of Wilde's personality, when he became a habitual devotee of the vice for which he was imprisoned. He had first experimented in that vice, says Ransom, in 1886. His experiments became a habit in 1889. Well, in 1886 I was a boy, fifteen years of age, at Winchester School, and I had never so much as heard of Oscar Wilde. Whereas in 1889 I was eighteen years of age, and in the south of France with a tutor, and was not to meet Wilde, whose name was still unknown to me, till nearly three years later. So that by the time we did meet, he had already found his way to the lowest moral depths, without my juvenile assistance. It is to be noted further that both Ross and Sherard knew Wilde long before I did, and, according to their own showing, were his constant and faithful companions until I arrived on the scene. Both of them swear that they never heard him use an objectionable phrase or an obscene remark, and that they had no inkling of his aberration whereas I, a callow undergraduate from Oxford, with so simple an outlook upon life that, in spite of my classical training, I never clearly understood the nature of Wilde's viciousness till the time of the trials, am alleged to have known everything, and to have been the prime mover in events which had occurred years before I was on the scene at all. Then again, let us take the accounts of what happened immediately after Wilde came out of prison. During the time of his incarceration, some sympathiser or other, a lady, by the way, put up a thousand pounds for the use of Wilde, 
so that he might have money by him while he was in prison and a sufficient sum to face the world with when he came out there can be no doubt whatever that wilde had at least eight hundred pounds at his command on the day he left prison ransom tells us that he immediately crossed the channel for dieppe where he stayed for some days and drove about with mr robert ross and mr reginald turner examining the surrounding villages most of which seemed uninhabitable at the end of a week he took rooms in the inn at the little hamlet of berneval then he took a chalet for the season and talked about building a house he asked for his pictures and japanese gold paper that should provide a fitting background for lithographs by rothenstein and shannon sherard tells us that at berneval his resources melted away in his hands he spent money with the recklessness of sailors on shore and prisoners free of jail in inviting friends to visit him at berneval he used to ask those who were married to bring their wives with them he showed himself to those who had the privilege of seeing him during the weeks he spent in berneval a gentleman a hero and a christian doubtless the italics are mine and i make no comment i was in paris and later in aix-les-bains with my mother during the brief bright brotherly berneval weeks when oscar wilde was getting rid of the last of his substance and throwing out of the window as it were the money which should have been used reasonably to maintain him until he could cast about for work i heard from wilde that he was all right and going well and strong and that he had dear so-and-so and dear so-and-so to visit him several letters passed between us and he kept on saying that he would come to see me ultimately when i had decided to take a villa at naples it was arranged that wilde should visit me there just before i started for naples i got a long letter in which he explained that he had spent his last shilling that all his friends were gone and that he hadn't even sufficient money to pay his fare to naples i telegraphed a sufficient sum to cover his expenses and he joined me there at the royal hotel soon after i moved into the villa giudice at posilippo taking wilde with me in less than three weeks at berneval he had got through eight hundred pounds and he came to me penniless accepting for what i had myself given him it is suggested that his coming to naples was the result of frantic appeals and persuasions on my part in point of fact he came because he had nowhere else to go and because nobody else would have him he required neither luring nor tempting which he certainly would not have had from me in any case and he was very glad to find a refuge in my establishment there is just one other point and i shall have done with this very unpleasant part of my subject the people who suggest that in some unexplained manner i was the means of separating wilde from his wife forget that wilde left prison in may eighteen ninety seven and did not join me at naples until the end of august of the same year we have seen that immediately on his release from prison he went to dieppe and was driving about with ross and turner why did they not take him to his wife they were with him for weeks at berneval and so was sherard why was the reconciliation which sherard professes to have laboured like hercules to arrange never brought about of course the answer is alfred douglas stood between them the fact is that alfred douglas did nothing of the sort what actually happened was this wilde never dreamed of rejoining mrs wilde or becoming reconciled to her while his money lasted when his money was spent he wrote to ross and asked if more could not be raised ross replied that nothing more could be done wilde then wrote to his wife to inquire if she would receive him as her husband wilde asserted that she sent him a reply full of hums and haws and imposed a number of what he described as absurd conditions the letter drove him into a fury and i believe he never wrote again to her in his life or she to him the plain fact is as the unpublished part of de profundis shows that wilde had never forgiven me for what he believed to be my neglect of him while he was in prison 
and that if the supplies of money had held out he would never have come near me but when he found that his admirers and supporters in london were not disposed to keep him in the lap of luxury at berneval and that they considered his miserable pittance of under three pounds a week sufficient for him to live upon his thoughts turned towards naples where he knew no such views of economy were likely to prevail he came to me on false pretences because he knew that de profundis had not been destroyed and from that time forward to the day of his death i had the honour and pleasure of supporting him End of chapter 8chapter nine of oscar wilde and myself by lord alfred douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain naples and paris when wilde came to the villa giudice he was in fair health and reasonable spirits that he had eaten and drunk too much at berneval he freely admitted but on the whole he was in good physical condition from the end of august to the middle of november he had the run of my villa as my guest, and I paid the whole of the housekeeping expenses, including the tradesmen's bills for food and wine, the servants' wages, and so forth, to which expenses Wilde never so much as contributed a farthing piece. So far as I am aware, the life he lived here was perfectly proper and without reproach. He had brought with him from Berneval a rough draft of part of the Ballad of Reading Jail, which he read to me. It has been stated on supposed authority that Wilde composed none of the Ballad of Reading Jail during the time of his imprisonment. He told me that he had composed certain of the stanzas in prison, and he added to them at Berneval, but there can be no question that the poem was completed at Naples. He laboured over it in a manner which I had never known him to labour before, every word had to be considered every rhyme and every cadence carefully pondered i had ballad of reading jail for breakfast dinner and tea and for many weeks it was almost our sole topic of conversation for my own part i too was busy with literary work and i wrote at naples during this period some of my best sonnets and occupied myself with various translations we had not an idle week during the whole time we were together it was one of the charges against me in the ransom case that i hindered wilde in his literary production and that he never did anything worth doing when he was with me how maliciously false these statements were may be gathered from the fact that he planned and wrote the whole of a woman of no importance while we were together at lady mount temple's house at babacombe that he wrote the whole of the importance of being earnest at worthing where we shared a house and the ideal husband partly at goring where we shared a house and partly in london while we were continually together while he composed and completed the final version of the ballad of reading jail whilst staying in my villa at naples i have no desire to take credit to myself for another man's work but many collaborations between authors have been acknowledged on much less slender grounds than it would be possible for me to set up in the matter of the aforesaid plays and of the aforesaid ballad of reading jail if i were disposed to do so in the ordinary course of events i would never have said a single word on the subject it seemed to me perfectly natural that as we were together wilde should show me what he was doing and read me what he was writing and as he thereby invited advice and criticism it seemed to be perfectly natural that i should give it and that he should adopt it the truth is that wilde consistently made free use of such gifts as i possessed that i assisted him to many a piece of dialogue and many a gibe which has helped to make him famous and that i gave him very material aid and counsel in the matter of the ballad of reading jail there are passages in this latter poem which he lifted holus bolus from a poem of my own and it must be remembered that 
while up to the time that he left reading jail he had affected some scorn of the ballad form and knew next to nothing of its possibilities i had given a great amount of attention to the study of that form and had produced the ballad of perkin warbeck and the ballad of st vitus which latter wilde read for the first time at naples and with which he was mightily impressed it would be preposterous for me to claim more than my due as regards the literary side of our friendship and i had perhaps better put the position this way i have never denied that i learned things from wilde and that up to a certain point i owe a good deal to him in the literary sense on the other hand in view of what he said it is necessary for me to point out that wilde owes just as much to me as i owe to him and for that matter a great deal more i have written neither plays nor poems which embody a single word or phrase of his and i never took a literary hint from him in my life he has done me the honour to use a great deal of alfred douglas and he is perfectly welcome all i ask is that i may not be maligned in consequence although our life at the villa giudice was perfectly harmless and consisted mainly of fairly strenuous literary toil the fact that we were together did not please certain of wilde's friends and the scandalmongers were set busy again how easy it is to make scandal was prettily illustrated by no less a personage than mr justice darling during the course of the ransom trial are you aware mr campbell said his lordship to the defending counsel are you aware of the reputation of naples of course mr campbell shook his head in the most deprecatory manner and the jury made a mental note that a villa at naples meant the very lowest depths of wickedness and profligacy anybody who knows europe at all knows perfectly well that naples was then and is now a resort of the most exclusive set of the italian aristocracy and that there is a large and highly respectable english colony there my grandmother the late honourable mrs alfred montgomery lived there for twenty years and there was not a person of position in the place by whom i was not known or with whom i was not on calling terms if i cared to follow up my social duties there is nothing at all about the reputation of naples to differentiate it from rome or genoa or florence or venice or any other italian city many people of distinction whom mr justice darling might not be sorry to know continue to make a point of going there every season well just as there were brave men before agamemnon so there were people who could ferret out scandal even from the most harmless method of life before mr justice darling wilde and i were together at naples and malice and leering gossip were abroad with their abominable insinuations before one had time to say jackknife the reports naturally came to the ears of my people who were much distressed and upset by them and it was pointed out to me that i was doing myself great damage by befriending this man and that i ought to send him about his business one of the attache from the british embassy at rome in which city i had spent the winter of eighteen ninety six with my mother came to naples at the instigation of the ambassador expressly to see me and to urge on me the advisability of dissociating myself from wilde he told me that the fact that i had wilde as a guest in my house was causing all sorts of unpleasant gossip and he even went so far as to say that it was not fair to them at the embassy that i should persist in giving cause for such gossip as they had all made a point of being civil and friendly to me when i was in rome i told him that i cared nothing for gossip and scandal that i had asked wilde to stay with me because he had nowhere else to go and was practically without means and that it was unthinkable that in these circumstances i should turn him out of my house simply because evil-minded people chose to concern themselves with what was no affair of theirs <laughs>
he was very insistent and when he found that i was not to be moved he got annoyed with me told me i was a quixotic fool and that i should live to be very sorry for having befriended a beast like wild who would get everything he could out of me and then probably turn round and abuse me i was very indignant at this prophetic pronouncement and we parted in anger i believed then and i believe now that my attitude was the right one and the gentlemanly one in the right sense of the word i knew that oscar wilde was hard at work on his poem i believed that his life was clean and that he was determined to keep from his old evil courses and i knew that my life was just as proper as it always had been and i consequently saw no reason for turning upon my friend the world was welcome to shrug its shoulders if it cared to and i proposed to leave it to its shrugging but the feeling amongst my friends in england largely got up and fermented by my enemies ultimately became so strong that it was proposed to stop my financial supplies unless i consented to a separation from wilde i was thus forced to capitulate but i did not do so without a struggle and without making provision for the man who was dependent upon me i arranged to leave him at the villa giudice the rent of which had been paid in advance and i arranged that my mother should send him two hundred pounds which would enable him to live in comfort for a month or two and i further arranged to let him have additional money as he wanted it i make special reference to the sum of two hundred pounds because it is a payment which can be authenticated and in fact was authenticated at the ransom trial it is true that at the very moment when he was writing to me an acknowledgment of these sums and to express his gratitude for my kindness he was complaining to ross in a letter produced at the ransom trial that i had deserted him because his money was done but every one with the slightest knowledge of wilde's affairs knows perfectly well that all the money wilde had was the allowance of two pounds nineteen and odd which came to him weekly through his friends the general untrustworthiness of wilde's accusation is obvious on the face of it any one acquainted with him would moreover have laughed at his impudence in saying that i expected him to raise money i knew wilde too well to expect him to raise money even in his alleged palmy days and that i should have been ass enough to suppose that when he came to me at naples an ex-convict an undischarged bankrupt and on a railway ticket that i had paid for he could be financially useful to me is too ridiculous for words yet ransom gets into the critical study the following choice sentences soon after wilde left berneval for naples those who controlled the allowance that enabled him to live with his friend purposely stopped it his friend as soon as there was no money left him it was said wilde a most bitter experience in a bitter life he went to paris the last sentence should have had an addendum it should have read he went to paris with two hundred pounds of lord alfred douglas's money in his pocket which had been sent to him per mr moradi and the marchioness of queensbury but it doesn't of course wilde went to paris and he went the moment he heard i was proposing to live there it was in december of eighteen ninety seven that he came and took an apartment at a hotel in the rue marsalier a few weeks earlier i came to paris and became the tenant of a flat in the avenue kleber he might just as well have lived at my flat for the use he made of his hotel except to sleep in for a whole year that is to say down to the end of eighteen ninety eight he used my flat as though it were his own invariably turning up at meal times when he had nowhere else to lunch or dine and never failing to extract from me a good deal more than i could at that period 
afford to give him in the way of money to tide him over his constant and ever recurring difficulties i believe that from time to time he picked up various sums of money on his own in january or february of eighteen ninety eight he published the ballad of reading jail through leonard smithers and later i believe he obtained some small advances of money from theatrical managers for plays which he was always going to write but of which he never produced a line the rights of one of these he seems to have sold for sums varying from twenty to a hundred pounds to at least half a dozen different persons and he also sold for small sums the plots of two plays and several short stories which have since been given to the public by another hand but whatever money he got did him no good a couple of hundred francs would take him away from his dinner at the avenue Kleber to do himself well with a roaring company of boulevardiers but the next day he was back at lunch full of complaints of the hardness of the world and full of groans over his difficulties i speedily came to consider him in the light of a permanent pensioner and my servants had instructions to give him food and not infrequently lent him money in my absence during eighteen ninety nine and nineteen hundred his work went from bad to worse at the end of eighteen ninety nine i took a shooting box in scotland jointly with my brother douglas of howick and i was in scotland until the death of my father in january nineteen hundred i came into a considerable amount of money under my father's will and the very first payment i made out of my inheritance was one hundred pounds which i sent to oscar wilde in paris out of this money he took a trip to switzerland by the time he came back i was at the hotel conde in chantilly where i had acquired a racing stable of course i was often in paris and whenever i was there i made a point of asking wilde to lunch or dine and i never left him without handing him sums of money my pass-books show that in a single year after the death of my father i gave wilde nearly four hundred pounds in cheques alone the figures appear in my bank-book and were proved at the ransom trial and i must have given him twice as much in hard cash or notes at the very least penny he had from me that year quite a thousand pounds over and above more or less constant entertainment it was almost impossible for me to take a meal with him and keep money in my pocket he would come to the restaurant or hotel where we were to meet with a dejected and depressed look on him as who should say behold how we are harassed and reduced and in what pain of mind we exist i would give him of the best to cheer and comfort him but his spirits insisted on remaining damp and it was only with difficulty that one could get a smile out of him when the time came for parting if i put my hand in my pocket and handed him five or six hundred francs well and good if not he would order another old brandy and open up a dreadful tale as to the condition of his bill at the hotel the attitude of his landlord about it and his own desperation and despair in the end i got more or less into the habit of handing him what i proposed to give him before we proceeded to refresh ourselves i found that by this means the old oscar wilde was brought to the front and we could talk pleasantly together as gentlemen should i remember a certain occasion on which one of our sittings had been prolonged until a very late hour i had taken the precaution to hand him a note for a thousand francs before we sat down to dine he took his usual abundant share of the good things and we talked and laughed over our string of liqueurs and let dull care go his own way when i called for the bill wilde suddenly pulled a long and piteous face my dear boy he said money ah oh, money i hate to distress you but i really must have a thousand francs now 
i cannot return to my hotel unless i have with me money to pay at least part of the bill i don't mind telling you that i am without a penny in the world and if i do not go to the hotel to-night i shall be homeless but my dear oscar i said i have just given you a thousand francs which you put in your pocket he looked at me as one amazed and then burst into a fit of coughing laughter i laughed too though he could have lived quite comfortably on what i gave him and though he had as we have seen a weekly allowance which should at least have kept him from starvation there can be no doubt that towards the end of his life wilde underwent a certain amount of privation he resorted to all sorts of desperate shifts to get money and composed many very plausible begging letters but just as pretty well every decent door was shut to him so people had begun to steal their hearts against him especially as he was now drinking in a most reckless way and made no secret of the fact that he had once more given himself over to his old habits he became a sort of show for the bohemians of paris the sport and mock of the boulevard and the reproach of english letters in the city of light he got his dinners on credit and borrowed money from waiters his health was on the downgrade in consequence of the intensification by alcohol of a terrible disease he had contracted he took to weeping and cursing at the slightest provocation and though his wit would flame out and his learning remained with him to the last it was a poor wreck and shadow of himself which i saw from time to time when i went to paris on various occasions in the year nineteen hundred all through my acquaintance with him after his release from prison it had required a good deal of pluck to be seen about with him he was known and notorious wherever we went and i have seen men leave cafes because he had entered and heard lulls in conversation and unpleasant jibes when we have visited restaurants together at some of the places which we frequented they would have turned him out had it not been for the fact that apparently they could not afford to turn me out in his later period the feeling against him grew more and more pronounced his companionships and resorts were of the vilest and his self-respect was almost entirely gone of wilde's life in paris before he began to break up the following is a good sample daily itinerary he would rise late say at half past eleven or twelve o'clock and walk from his hotel in the latin quarter through the louvre to the cafe de la paix where he would sit and drink aperitifs before going to lunch in the afternoon he would go to the grand cafe where he would drink till dinner time the evening he generally spent where his friends might lead him and some of them led him to pretty dreadful places when i came to paris from chantilly if i had not made an appointment with him beforehand i could always find him at the grand cafe or the cafe de la paix of a morning or at the cafe julien or the calaisaya bar of an afternoon so long as i remained in paris he lunched and dined with me as a matter of course pilards mers and the cafe de la paix being our chief resorts at his meals he behaved always like a pleased child provided that is to say you would put him into a decent humour with a present of money beforehand he was the biggest eater i ever knew and the only man i ever met in my life who could drink quantities of champagne at each meal and keep on doing it he had a fine head for drink and it was not until eighteen months or so before his death that he began to lose it intoxication would come over him suddenly and without apparent warning he would rise from his seat and say my dear fellow i am sorry but i perceive that i am drunk then he would call loudly for a cab and stumble forth 
he made a great joke about these drunken fits and one day said to me i have made a wonderful discovery i find that alcohol taken persistently and in sufficiently large quantities produces all the effects of intoxication and so it certainly did at mayer's there was a real eighteen hundred brandy which had originally been laid down at the tuileries wilde had some of it after a dinner there and immediately began to make mayer's his home the stuff cost five or six francs a glass but this was nothing to wilde if he happened to have money or was the guest of somebody else he used to compliment the maitre d'hotel on this excellent brandy and there was no getting him away from it wilde had few friends other than myself who could be of use to him financially frank harris used to come over occasionally and take him to dine at durand's and i know that harris also obliged him with money from time to time too he picked up odd acquaintances who had means and were disposed to show him kindness but for the most part they were americans and their capacity for befriending the man whom one of them described as england's premier poet dramatist exhibited a great want of staying power i was in scotland shooting when i had a letter from ross to say that wilde was ill but that it was nothing serious on the next day i got a telegram announcing that he was dead and asking what should be done in regard to his affairs i went straight to paris and to the hotel d'alsace where wilde lay dead i there saw ross and turner they told me that wilde had no money i promptly provided funds for the expenses of the moment and i paid for the funeral at which ross turner and myself were the only english mourners after the funeral ross handed me a list of small debts of wilde's consisting of unpaid dinner bills and sums he had borrowed from waiters and such like the amount being between twenty and thirty pounds these obligations i paid when wilde had been dead three years i received from a monsieur du boucher dentist of paris a letter in which he pointed out that wilde had owed him six hundred francs for professional services and that the account had never been paid i wrote to monsieur du boucher advising him to apply to mr adrian hope who i understood was wilde's trustee later du boucher wrote to tell me that he had applied to mr adrian hope but that mr hope professed to know nothing of wilde's affairs or to be in any way responsible in the face of this letter i paid monsieur du boucher six hundred francs in settlement of the account and got his receipt for it there was no question at that time of ross being wilde's legal representative wilde made no will but over and over again before he died he said to me of course if i die first you will look after my literary affairs ross was made literary executor of wilde's estate in nineteen o six six years after wilde's death after the funeral he came to me and said wilde has nothing but a tumble of old papers i suppose you don't mind if i go through them i told him to do what he thought best and there the matter ended ross was a person whom wilde and i found useful because he was always willing to attend to occasional matters of business for us which we were too indolent to attend to ourselves and this was the light in which i regarded him when i acquiesced in the suggestion which he then made one would think from the continual references to wilde's allowance being paid to him through mr ross that wilde was in some way in a condition of tutelage to ross as a matter of fact wilde arranged for the payment through ross simply to save himself the trouble and annoyance of corresponding with his wife's solicitors End of chapter nine
Chapter Ten of Oscar Wilde and Myself, by Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ballad of Reading Jail. If Wilde is to last as a poet, it will be on the strength of the Ballad of Reading Jail. The Sphinx may also endure, though its chances, for reasons which I shall explain in the chapter on Wilde's poetry, are not comparable with those of the ballad. Criticism of the work itself is not entirely my present purpose. It is a work which stands out head and shoulders above any other of Wilde's performances by virtue of its human appeal and its relative freedom from defects which render the bulk of Wilde's poetry practically unreadable. It is singular, too, as being the only work of importance which Wilde completed after his imprisonment. There is a story, and I believe a true one, to the effect that before Wilde left prison, a certain American journalist offered him a thousand pounds for a two-hours interview on the subject of his prison experience. The offer is said to have been communicated to Wilde, and Wilde is understood to have replied, with some hauteur, that he was astonished that such a proposal should be placed before a gentleman. This was very fine talk, and it has been widely applauded by Wilde's admirers. I happen to know, however, that within three months of his release, Wilde regretted bitterly that he had not closed with the American gentleman's proposition. At the time the offer was made, Wilde knew that he had eight hundred pounds behind him, and he had been given to understand that large sums of money would be subscribed for him by his troop of admiring friends outside. The eight hundred pounds were there, right enough, but the mammoth subscription, or whip-round, resulted in the collection of little more than a hundred pounds, the major portion of which was contributed by Frank Harris. Wilde believed also that on his release he would find plenty of editors and publishers waiting for him, with hope in their eyes and fat checks in their hands, and that he would be able to pick and choose among them in the matter of placing anything he might choose to say or write. Here again, however, he was mistaken. Nobody deemed it worth while to make a bid for a wild book or a wild play, and he went to France commissionless. As the beautiful Berneval weeks slipped away with the beautiful Berneval money, he began to have twinges of anxiety. He knew his world well, and he knew that his world could do nothing for him. He had discovered, likewise, to his amazement, that Oscar Wilde, even with two years' hard labour to his credit, was not in any large sense marketable, whether from a journalistic or a literary point of view. It was the general feeling of being out of it which spurred him on to build up the Ballad of Reading Jail. I know for a fact that he made offers to be interviewed for much less than a thousand pounds to the editors of various newspapers in England and America, but no one came near him. All he could manage to do for himself was to get certain letters printed in the Daily Chronicle, and for these, of course, he received nothing in the way of remuneration, so that the Ballad of Reading Jail became important to him in a double sense. He had taken the line that he was still an artist, and too securely placed in his art to condescend to low interviewing. He also felt that his one chance of getting back into something approximating to public favour was to produce some sort of a work of sustained and supreme power. This is why the Ballad of Reading Jail is so long and so good. Wilde put all he knew and all he could into it. He even went to what was for him the fearful and unthinkable length of truckling somewhat to the more ordinary human sentiments in the tone of the poem, and avoided, as far as he could, those idiosyncrasies of Wilde the verse-maker which had always provoked the expostulation of the critics and the contempt or laughter of the general public. As we have seen, the Ballad of Reading Jail was completed at Naples. I believe that Wilde was satisfied with every word of it. He had written to certain of his friends in England, pooh-poohing it, and pretending that it was in the manner of Sims, 
but he knew perfectly well that fifty sims rolled into one would not have produced such a poem and his self-deprecations were intended to soften his abandonment of the superior point of view rather than to express what he really felt having finished the poem the next thing was to sell it his thoughts turned to america the land of hope and glory and the land which had evolved that never-to-be-forgotten live journalist with his thousand pounds for an interview wilde solemnly forwarded the ballad of reading jail to a new york paper the name of which wild horses shall not drag out of me and proffered it for dollars and the new york paper proceeded solemnly to erect an everlasting monument to its own stupidity by promptly returning the manuscript so that for the two or three months the ballad of reading jail was kicking about in the world with nobody to publish it in the meantime wilde had gone to paris and he was there sought out by the late leonard smithers a publisher who had done a great deal for beardsley dowson and a number of quaint geniuses whose names are now forgotten and who had also published an unexpurgated edition of burton's arabian nights smithers took wilde out to dinner produced an immediate handful of louis and told him that he was prepared to publish anything that he cared to write the ballad of reading jail was raked out of a drawer and handed to smithers and smithers published it in england in february eighteen ninety eight the first edition consisted of eight hundred copies at two and sixpence with thirty copies on japanese vellum six further editions were called for in twelve or fourteen months and smithers sent from time to time various useful checks for royalties i believe that he also purchased the book rights of wilde's plays but that was the end of his great publishing schemes for oscar wilde for wilde produced nothing out of which a book could be made after the ballad i may note that two or three years after wilde's death smithers who by this time had fallen upon somewhat evil days called on me and told me that he had drawings and if i remember rightly plates for producing the harlot's house in a very sumptuous and decorative form the drawings were by miss althea giles and seemed to me to be very fine with a view of giving both miss giles and smithers a lift i and a friend of mine put up the money smithers required to go on with the publication the harlot's house had never been published in a book though it had appeared in some obscure periodical it did not occur to me that there could be any objection to smithers publishing the book which is a trifle in itself and no more than thirty-six lines long however the next i heard about it was that ross had stepped in in his capacity of literary executor and stopped the publication ross did this without so much as referring to me in the matter though as far as i knew we were on terms of friendship at the time i suppose this is an instance of what mr sherard calls keeping a level commercial head in looking after wilde's estate chapter End eleven of, chapter of oscar wilde and myself by lord alfred douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain the truth about de profundis in nineteen o five there was given to the world with a great flourish of trumpets a book entitled de profundis which purported to be a work by oscar wilde to this book robert ross supplied the preface it will be necessary for us to examine this preface very thoroughly ross commences by explaining that for a long time curiosity had been expressed about the manuscript of de profundis which was known to be in my possession the author having mentioned the existence to many other friends presuming that wilde mentioned the existence of this manuscript to any of his other friends i very much doubt whether he ever explained to them the nature of its contents he no more dared do this than he dared have attempted to publish it for he knew perfectly well that if he had told many other friends whispers of his vileness and duplicity would have been sure to get round to me and there might have been an end of my friendship 
and an end of my gifts at our first meeting after his release wilde told me that he had a hideous confession to make he said that while he was in prison he had been told that i was no longer loyal to him and that i had expressed contempt for his sufferings he said that he knew now that this was not true but that it had preyed on his mind and he had allowed it to anger him to such an extent that he had written me a very fierce and abominable letter and had it forwarded by ross i told him that i had a recollection of having received a copy of some such letter not the letter itself from ross and with it a covering letter from ross in which he said how sorry he was to have to send wilde's letter but that wilde was apparently more or less out of his mind in consequence of the treatment he had received in prison and was disposed to quarrel with everybody and that he ross hoped that i should take no notice of what he was sending i threw the copy of wilde's letter into the fire and i wrote to ross to tell him to mind his own business and to point out that if wilde had anything to say to me he could say it in his own handwriting so that when wilde opened up his hideous confession i naturally thought that he was referring to the letter ross had sent me and i said my dear oscar i never read more than three or four lines of the wretched thing i gathered that it was an ill-tempered letter and threw it into the fire don't let us talk any more about it i quite understand how you must have felt but it is all over now and there is nothing more to be said it struck me at the moment as curious that wilde should be wanting to make confessions as to having written a letter which he knew i had received but i had no wish to pursue unpleasant matters and the conversation dropped from that day forward though he was continually in my company and continually accepting kindnesses at my hand he never breathed a single word about unpleasant letters or secret manuscripts or anything of the kind it has been suggested by people who wish to make out that i had a copy of de profundis sent to me in wilde's lifetime that the letter which i received through ross and burned was in fact de profundis but this cannot be so for the very simple reason that de profundis is a fifty thousand word manuscript whereas the letter i burned covered only several sides of ordinary letter paper in ross's handwriting i fail to see how wilde's position is in the least degree improved even if it were granted that i had received a copy of the de profundis manuscript but as a fact i did not receive it ross goes on to tell us that wilde had instructed him to publish de profundis those instructions mr ross tells us were contained in a letter from wilde written to him obviously from prison part of this letter mr ross has published in de profundis but he omitted the passages which gave him the actual instructions i should have much liked to have seen these for they might have thrown some light on wilde's action in leaving behind him in the hands of others a posthumous libel on a man who had been his friend up to and during his prison period and to whom he afterwards turned for assistance and refuge it was not till de profundis was announced to be forthcoming by the press that i ever knew that wilde had left behind him an unpublished manuscript of any sort or kind when i learned that there was a manuscript and that it was to be published under the editorship of ross i was very much astonished wilde had never spoken to me of any manuscript which would be long enough to make a book neither had ross and neither had anybody else i was so astonished that i went round to see ross who at that time kept a picture shop in ryder street i said to him what is all this about an unpublished manuscript by wilde there is no such manuscript he said oh yes there is i said then why have you not told me of it before and why did wilde not tell me of it ross said i wanted to keep it as a surprise 
This struck me as being rather strange, and I said, Wilde was hard up and kept on selling anything he could get rid of. Why should he not have published it himself? Ross replied, He didn't do that because the manuscript consists of a long letter. It contains a lot of disagreeable writing about you and other people. But I have cut this out, and what is left makes a nice little book. I said that it seemed a very extraordinary thing that nobody should have heard of this before, but Ross assured me that he would publish nothing that would hurt Wilde's reputation, and that the book would do him good. And there the matter ended. When De Profundis was published, there was not a word to indicate that it had been addressed to me, and not to Ross, at all. And the opposite deduction is one which the reader of the preface may fairly draw. For example, Ross quotes Wilde as saying that the privilege of writing to Ross at great length was one for which he was grateful to the governor of the prison. Moreover, this impression still remains. Holbrook Jackson, in his book The 1890s, published 1913, writes of Wilde, During his imprisonment he wrote De Profundis in the form of a long letter to his friend Robert Ross. De Profundis was published in 1895, and I never knew till 1912, seventeen years later, when the ransom case was toward, that it was really addressed to me, and that the unpublished parts were still in existence, and amounted to more than half of the whole manuscript. Still less did I dream that the unpublished moiety, as any reader of the reports of the ransom trial can see for himself, contained gross libels on myself, or that the British Museum authorities had kindly consented to accept it as a present to the nation, without so much as consulting any of us. I leave the facts as I have set them forth to the judgment of the public. The existence of the De Profundis manuscript forces us to one of two alternatives. Wilde, according to Ross, wished it to be published, and gave it to Ross with a view to publication, never afterwards changing his mind on the subject, or desiring that the manuscript should be destroyed. In that case, he has exhibited a perfidy which is without parallel in history, inasmuch as for three years after leaving prison, and right up till the time of his death, he professed to be my devoted and attached friend, and accepted in friendship what I was very pleased to give in friendship. The other alternative is that, on leaving prison and finding that he had been misinformed as to my attitude toward him, he repented the writing of this manuscript and intended it to be destroyed, but failed to cancel his instructions. While the ransom case was pending, I wrote Ross a letter setting out the facts stated above, namely, that I had never any idea that De Profundis was a letter addressed to me, or that it had any connection with the letter which Ross had sent me in 1897. I also informed him of Wilde's solitary reference to the letter, which I have previously referred to. I expected Ross to give me some reply by way of explanation, but received none. I consider that, in view of the circumstances, he might have taken the opportunity of ridding the memory of his friend of what, in the absence of such an explanation, must be regarded by all fair-minded persons as an act of cowardly and abominable treachery. As it is, seeing how zealous an adherent of Wilde Ross is, I am forced to the conclusion that Wilde was playing the Judas with me all the time we were together at Naples, and all the time that he was lunching and dining and meeting his difficulties at my expense in Paris. Before proceeding to refute charges brought against me at the ransom trial, based on Wilde's posthumous libel, I should like to inquire whether it can be considered proper, either on literary grounds or on grounds of public policy, that a book like De Profundis should be given to the world at all. Mr. Ransom tells us that the book is composed of passages from a long letter, 
the complete publication of which would be impossible in this generation the passages were selected and put together he adds by mr robert ross with a skill that it is impossible sufficiently to admire quite so but it can be demonstrated out of the text that mr ross's selectings and puttings together have in the net result entirely deceived the public not only with regard to the nature and intentions of de profundis as a book but also with regard to wilde's own character and his attitude towards his own misfortune what right has mr ross or any other person no matter how skilled to indulge in this kind of literary liberty despite what wilde himself said to the contrary it is always important that we should know as much as is possible to be known about any man who sets up to teach us and especially is this so in the case of an author like wilde whose whole writings amount really to a sort of personal statement mr ross recognises this much because in his version of de profundis he offers no samples of wilde the vituperative spitter out of venom or of wilde the braggart and vain boaster such as appear in the reports of the ransom trial but shows us simply the wilde who weeps profusely and swears that he has turned saint and i do this says ross in his preface hoping that my efforts will give many readers a different impression of the witty and delightful writer the different impression has obviously resulted wilde emerges from the mire a gracious suffering forgiving magnanimous figure the extracts from wilde's own manuscript read and relied on by the counsel for the defendant in the ransom trial prove him to have been nothing of the kind and for that matter the direct opposite on literary grounds alone we are surely entitled to protest against such a dangerous violation of the normal editorial function if we are to take de profundis for an approved precedent a literary executor is justified in treating a dead man's inedited manuscripts in such a way that he is made to say only half of what he really did say and so made to appear the direct opposite of what he really was on public grounds one is entitled to protest even more strongly we have in wilde a person of careless and vicious life whose talents were always carelessly and at times viciously employed such a man was almost in the nature of things bound to come to a miserable and degraded end wilde ended up in prison for his offences and if he had really repented and had really written de profundis as published without the suppressed portion and lived out the rest of his life in a decent way it would have been possible and proper for us to forgive and forget a great deal but unless he has maligned himself most madly he never did repent and it is certain that de profundis as published does not represent his sentiments or his nature the result has been that a false and specious glamour has been put upon the aims and trend of wilde's life and writings and very generally the apologia contained in the boldlerized de profundis is regarded as a sufficient apologia pro vita sua commenting on the reading of the unpublished parts of de profundis at the ransom trial the outlook said those who heard its unpublished portions fall from the lips of the learned junior counsel for the defence or even those who had to be content with such portions their newspapers gave them had the unusual experience of sharing the privileges reserved for posterity they had added to their knowledge of the last prose work of oscar wilde indeed they have gained their first true knowledge of the form in which it left his pen they know that it begins dear bosey and ends your affectionate friend oscar wilde but it is not always either friendly or affectionate they know that there are parts about 
meals and the influenza and the respect that is due to a great artist and especially such an artist as i am that are not an expression of the mood which gave to the world the well-known parts about christ they have learned for the first time that some parts have been taken and that other parts have been left to the nation in the parts that have been taken and strung like beads on a new string to form the book the world knows they have learned that the you addressed is not general and impersonal but the friend who whatever the rights and wrongs of last week has at least written poetry that is better than wilde's own in spite of the mood of scolding superiority in which the letter seems to have begun it has been suggested that the article from which this passage is an extract was written by my friend t w h crossland and inserted in the outlook through the influence of george wyndham anybody who is acquainted with london journalism knows that mr crossland has had nothing to do with the outlook since he resigned the literary editorship of that journal in nineteen o two and mr wyndham ceased to have any interest in the paper some months later the author of the article is so far as i am aware entirely unknown to me and in any case it was not written by my desire or inspiration i have already referred to certain charges against me in support of which passages from the unpublished parts of de profundis were put to me at the ransom trial and shown how preposterous they are i had an opportunity at the time of the ransom trial of reading a copy of the manuscript with great care and i say advisedly that in so far as it concerns me i had great difficulty in finding a single statement which could not be demonstrated to be utterly deliberately and ridiculously false if mr robert ross will remove his embargo i am open to print the whole of such portions of de profundis word for word and line for line with plain demonstrations of the absolute malice and contempt for the truth that wilde has exhibited right through the piece as it is at present i am prevented from quoting or even from paraphrasing any portions owing to the legal steps taken by mr ross but in order that it may never be suggested that i fear or admit the charges brought against me in the ransom trial and to clear myself from them i propose to deal with the more serious of them not already dealt with in chapter eight as assertions of fact and not even by way of paraphrase of the precious manuscript i should have preferred to put these charges into wilde's own words and so have given my posthumous libeller every opportunity of couching his attack in his own way and with all the master's skill but mr ross has prevented this by obtaining an injunction against me i do not think however that either he or the law can prevent me from dealing with allegations of fact made against me in cross-examination qua allegations of fact i have already referred to the falseness of wilde's charge that i hampered his work and that when i was by he was sterile i had to meet the charge in particular that when he was pressed to deliver the ideal husband he had to wait till i was away and then got on famously when i returned all work had to be abandoned this assertion is wantonly wrong when wilde was in working mood he worked and i never attempted to take him away from it the play was read to me scene by scene and line by line and so far from my having delayed its completion i materially assisted it if one were disposed to be flippant and to admit that wilde gives a correct description of our daily programme at st james's place one might inquire why if he found it impossible to work in the atmosphere of his own quiet and peaceful household and found it equally impossible to work at st james's place because of my interruptions he never locked the door of st james's place never contrived to be out
and never omitted to send me telegrams of inquiry and letters of pleasant rebuke if i happened to miss calling upon him wilde was too keen an artist to allow anything or anybody to come between him and what he would call a realizable mood the truth is that he would begin a work with great zeal and fury and apply himself to it and to the contemporaneous consumption of cigarettes and whiskies till he became utterly exhausted as a rule he completed what he had begun in a series of spurts and with periods of easy do-nothingness between whiles on the other hand there were occasions when he got stuck and he got stuck over more than one of his plays this is merely to say that he was like any other artist to blame me for it is childish or lunatic whichever you will wilde began the sphinx a work of which he was inordinately proud when he was little more than twenty years of age he was thirty-eight before he finished it and then apparently he had to call in no less a poet than robert harborough sherard author of whispers to help him out with rhymes ending with ah sherard tells us with great pomp and pride that he suggested nenophar a substantive of greek origin which had been worn to death by precious poets before either wilde or sherard was born but the sudden and glorious discovery of which by sherard appears to have transported them both into the seventh heaven it is absolutely untrue that my mother the dowager marchioness of queensbury ever informed wilde at bracknell that i was vain or wrong about money my mother has never been in the habit of discussing the characters of those near and dear to her with anybody much less with comparative strangers on his own showing wilde scarcely knew me at this period and on the only occasion he was at my mother's house near bracknell there were a dozen other guests staying in the house and his conversations with my mother would be of the very slightest and amount so far as she was concerned to the merest civilities when they met at lunch or dinner my mother is still alive and whether at bracknell or anywhere else she did not say to wilde what he professes she said it is the same with the charge that our residence at goring where i was well known cost him a fabulous sum if this is so seeing that we shared expenses of the goring establishment wilde appears to have let me off exceedingly cheaply for my half share for i do not recollect that it cost me more than twenty or thirty pounds a month excluding the rent of which i never heard inasmuch as wilde professed that the house had been lent to him by a well-known member of the peerage if thirteen hundred pounds were spent by wilde at goring during those three months all i can say is that at least twelve hundred must have gone in rent for we lived very simply there and there were no restaurants into which one could be lured to a meal which would cost a whole sovereign so goring won't do any more than the five thousand pounds worth of ortolans and perrier jouet one other small matter and i shall have done with this part of the subject i deny emphatically that i gambled and lost at algiers and expected him to pay my losses at the time wilde and i went to algiers together i had just come into some money and i took a suite of rooms at the best hotel in the place wilde stayed there with me and i paid the hotel bill myself there was not as far as i am aware a tripo or other gambling place much less a casino in algiers at that period so that neither of us could gamble even if we'd wished to wilde returned to london before me for business reasons but the business was entirely his own and had nothing to do with me and i lent him fifteen pounds to pay his fare home by some aberration or other he actually returned me this money paying a cheque for the amount into my account in london 
in all the literature of the subject that is to say in all the pass books banking accounts business and private letters and so forth that are in existence or ever did exist this is the sole and only instance of wilde ever paying a sum of money to me whereas it could be demonstrated out of the same documents that i paid a very great many sums to wilde in the safe seclusion of reading jail he sits tearfully penitent and remembers that fifteen pounds which no doubt loomed up in his memory like a shot tower he catches at it gleefully and uses it as a peg on which to hang a false preposterous lying story about meeting my gambling debts in a place where there is no gambling at the back of his mind he knew that nothing of the kind ever occurred yet the fifteen pound payment might have lent colour to the statement if it came to be investigated after my death and that was all the colour he had for his pretty statement i have no wish to be uncharitable to this man who doubtless suffered and suffered severely nobody could read the complete de profundis without perceiving that imprisonment destroyed wilde's moral fibre and crushed his spirit to such an extent that he became a sort of mrs gummidge who felt everything more than you do i am forced to think and to be quite frank i try to think that wilde cannot have been mentally responsible when he wrote this stupid and abominable manuscript that i am not alone in my opinion of what confinement and bitter discipline were doing for him will be evident from the following letter which i received from a close friend of ross's at the time when wilde was supposed to be angry with me the letter is dated from a house which was at that time occupied by ross and the writer of the letter my dear bosey your letter distresses me for i can say so little to comfort you and i would do all i can you will know by this time that i had seen oscar before i received your letter i saw him on saturday thirtieth november the very day you wrote and i only got your letter to-day tuesday you must not think that i do not know what oscar's change towards you must be to you but robbie will tell you that from the very first i never believed that it was more than a passing delirium of jail moral fever i naturally minimised to you and robbie when i wrote the horrors of the general prison surroundings but i have seen them and am confirmed in my belief that no man like oscar who is subject to them can be considered capable of exercising his ordinary mental or moral faculties what he says now no more expresses his proper natural feelings than do the ravings of a man in delirium i am certain that his mind has very much suffered but i think from what i have heard of him before and what i have seen of him that he is better and i think that he is conscious that he must make efforts to prevent his mind suffering more because he was so very anxious to get some rather drudging mental work to do in order to occupy and in a sort of way discipline his mind in former interviews he spoke of you just as a lunatic or a man in delirium does of the people they love best but the other day he did not do so he merely complained of some letter which you had written to him or to the governor i suppose of wandsworth which he had heard of but was not allowed to see i told him that i was certain that you would write no more he has to be talked to as a person very slowly recovering from delirium i could not have said anything to distress him just think he has only one half hour in the awful weeks of hideous prison life you must try to show the love which i know you have for him by the most difficult of all ways waiting there may be and probably is a good deal to be said for the view herein set forward and it would be inhuman not to make all necessary allowances but we are still left face to face with the unchallengeable fact that wilde was sane enough when he came out of prison 
that his health was on the whole improved by his sojourn there and that for three years he kept up his friendship with me and lived to a great extent on my bounty and that he never said a single word about the disgrace thanks for watching which mr ross please subscribe and click on the bell to turn on notifications Jeff